This video is brought to you in part by Manscaped. And just like Sonic the Hedgehog, they understand the importance of balls. Guys, does it look like the mystic ruins every time you take off your pants? Well, do yourself and your partner a favor and get yourself Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0. Inside, you're going to find the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer. Manscaped's been the leading brand in razors made specifically for those special areas. This one's mine, and I can personally confirm it works like a dream. Yeah, that's right. This one you're looking at has been used. It also comes with the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, and being an ancient creature that I am, I greatly appreciate this. Certainly beats tweezers. The package also comes with Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, and Performance Boxer Briefs, which I can confirm also feels great. But for real, guys, I am very thankful that Manscaped is out there making these products specifically for these reasons. You really should take your hygiene seriously, regardless of the jokes we're making here. And this is the best way to take care of that. The trimmers are waterproof, they help reduce odor, it reduces the risk of nicks and cuts and ingrown hairs. I was genuinely impressed with the performance package. And if that sounds good to you, you can save yourself 20% off your order and get free shipping if you head over to manscaped.com and use the offer code APOLOGIST. Links in the description. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring the video and let's get on to it. Knuckles Chaotix is such a vibe. It's been two years since we marathoned not only the game, but all of its characters on this channel, but I still find myself thinking of the game every now and then. I could gush about it yet again, but I think I did a fairly decent job. So hey, might as well put a compilation together. I always intended to have all of these videos slapped together like this. I'm not sure why it took me so long to get to it, especially since some of the things I say in these videos are a little outdated at this point. Last I checked, Sonic Mania 2 does not exist. But yeah, regardless of what little things might have changed here or there, my general opinions on everything we talk about still remain the same. And I actually had a bit of fun going back and reliving the experience of playing this game and putting all the stuff together for you guys. But I did want to do a little bit of preamble first, mostly just to say thank you for supporting the video, supporting the channel, and a massive thank you to Smax, who did some wonderful fan art for this collection as it was originally aired, and now that same piece of art serves as the thumbnail to this compilation. But that's enough of all that. Grab a snack, kick back, and without any further ado, this is the Complete Chaotix Compilation. Welcome back to November Chaotix, where we're spending all month long looking at everything Knuckles Chaotix. But is that even a fitting title? Sure, Sega wanted to capitalize on Knuckles' popularity, and the Archie book built an entire narrative around a dynamic with Knuckles as a leader of a group called the Chaotix, but there's a whole generation of Sonic fans who would probably classify it as Vector's Chaotix, as he is the leader of the modernized version of the team, the loudmouth, short-tempered head of a detective agency, actually. But we are getting a little ahead of ourselves, because Vector's story does not begin in Sonic Heroes or the comics. It doesn't even begin in Knuckles' Chaos. It begins almost right alongside Sonic the Hedgehog himself. This advice was passed on to me when I was much younger, and I pass it on to you now, aspiring artists. Do not throw out your art. You would be surprised at the kind of inspiration you can gain from old doodles once you give them another pass. I imagine that's what happened with our scaly friend here. See, early concept art featured Sonic in a band with a crocodile keyboardist. What you were looking at is the very first rendition of what would later be named Vector. Apparently, they were planning on using these guys in a sound test screen for the first game, but since the infamous Sega yell took a up so much memory, they just had to cut it. And it's a shame that never came to be, but the band concept would still be used in the now infamous Sonic manga, where we can see the briefest glimpse of Vector. There, there he is, right, right behind Sonic, right, just in that teeny tiny corner. And he would continue to cameo in concept art, as you can see here. Yes, prior to the release of Sega Sonic the arcade game, Mighty and Ray's first appearance, here we can see the crocodile right alongside his future Chaotix cohort. And as you can also see, Vector's classic design had been finalized a few years before his play 
Fable debut. And let's just jump right into that game, because this is where me and a lot of other 90s kids got our first glimpse of the crocodile. I remember looking at these new characters as a kid, and while green is my favorite color, Vector was my least favorite design. I mean, it looked like a Sonic character, no doubt about it, but they always had a magical way of making their characters barely look like the creatures they represented. But, like our two-tailed fox, Vector didn't seem very stylized to me. Sure, you got the merged eye, you can pick him out in a lineup from other cartoon crocs. I'm looking right at you, Archie. Seriously, the exact same comic! Maybe this is the difference between alligators and crocodiles in the world of Archie, but I think I'm giving them way too much credit. Also, I made this joke in another video, so let's carry on. I know it sounds weird nowadays, but back in the 90s, while I was waiting for these games to come out, we barely had any of Sonic's quote-unquote stupid friends cluttering up the place. So it was always exciting for me to see how Sega would interpret new species in their unique designs. And to me, Vector was just underwhelming. Even next to the barely reskinned Sonic over here, he looked like a cartoon crocodile with the bare minimum done to make him all Sonic-fied. And he has headphones with a cassette player? Couldn't even afford to get this guy a disc man? I mean, this was 1995. Even in the 90s, this was already looking outdated. And that's my problem. This was the first time a Sonic game character really and truly felt like he was made from the 90s. He felt like a poochie. That is, until I actually started to play the reptile. Because, oh my goodness, I love him so much. He is hands down the most expressive character in Knuckles Chaotix. And as expressive as these other rainbow rats had been up to this point, you'd think they show a little more joy while spinballing around these skate parks. But none of them ever really had. But Vector here is having the time of his life. I mean, seriously, he doesn't even walk, he struts. If you got it, flaunt it. Get down with your bad self, Gator Boy. I just can't help but smile while watching this guy. He's so gangly and awkward for a Sonic character. Seriously, if Sonic was Mickey Mouse with attitude, then Vector's a scaly goofy. But he doesn't care. He even looks over at the player and gives you a thumbs up while he's picking up speed. Eyes on the road, man. Also, come on, who doesn't love that donut shape while he jumps? He can shoot off in one of eight directions for his secondary jumping skill, and apparently that's where his name comes from? All right. Why is he so positive and carefree compared to the rest of the crew? Well, maybe it's because he's a deeply religious reptile. Yeah. All right, so that might be played up a little bit thanks to some goofy translation, but the Japanese version of events in Chaotix deal with the aftermath of the Death Egg Saga and a mysterious island rising from the ocean. Each of the Chaotix arrive for their own reasons, and Vector's, apparently, is because he viewed this phenomenon as a miracle of God. So he goes to explore this island of miracles, and from there he runs into the rest of the crew. This is the one and only time they ever even mention him believing in God, and I know a lot of the fanbase has played that up quite a bit. So, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. And hey, all you weirdos who keep trying to convert people in my comments, this is the Sonic character for you. Also, how's that working out for you guys? Seriously, what do you think you're accomplishing? Who is scrolling through the YouTube comments of a Sonic video on the fence about their entire belief structure and outlook on life, sees that comment and goes, man, I could use me some more Jesus. Oh, well, you, you guys do you. I will continue to keep scrolling on past those. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the original Japanese story of the Chaotix is honestly something I really wish they fleshed out. Because apparently monotheism is a thing in the world of Sonic the Hedgehog, and I would really love to see what God looks like to a reptile. And man, you think those YouTube comments are an aggressive attempt to convert people. Can you imagine that coming from a crocodile? Do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Honestly, I would love to see them flesh out the spiritual side of Sonic. Can't forget Amy's tarot cards, and I've already made some easy pot shots at Scientology thanks to Sonic Colors, but I'm once again getting off track and spending way too much time on some very touchy subjects. Let's get back to cartoon crocodiles. Another little interesting thing I've noticed about Vector was how much of his modern interpretation was already present in the UK. K Sonic comic. I've not finished the entire book yet, but I've definitely noticed some parallels here. In Fleetway, he is the leader of the Chaotix crew, and a real smarty pants. He's got a brain for science and deduction. He also acts as a liaison for a police force. Again, I got a lot more to read, but this really caught me off guard. I grew up in America, where Sega of Japan treated extended lore and media as, well, as an atheist would treat Vector while he was talking to them about his spiritual beliefs. I've got some good news for you! I got some pamphlets in the back of my 
my mouth! But yeah, while Classic Vector grew on me, and had technically been in the series since the very beginning, there really wasn't a whole lot to work off of outside of Knuckles' Chaotix. Maybe he got his name from all the directions he can jump, but you could also apply that to all the ways they presented his personality. He provided some backup to Knuckles in the Archie book, also hated his girlfriend, and apparently was originally Australian. We will get more into the Archie characterization of him and other characters as we cover it in Sonic Speed Reading, but early on, he's normally depicted as carefree comic relief, with headphones so loud he can take out flying saucers, or stop forest fires. And he did some interesting stuff in the Fleetway book, but already you can see some drastically different takes on his personality. Goofball on one end, straight man on the other. But then you get to Sonic Heroes, where they finally put some meat on Vector. Quite literally. Look at the guy. Honestly, between the classic and modern redesign, I really cannot think of a more drastic change than Vector. <laughs> and I love it. The separate neck just made him look all lanky and weird, but this, this is what I'm talking about. This is a proper Sonic character design. And it also looks more like a crocodile. Which is weird because, as I've already stated, the more you Sonicify a creature, the less it looks like the real thing. Seriously though, it was nice to see them branch out a bit in terms of body types in this universe. I love his accessories, and the shoes, and the bracelet colors. It's just a massive step up from the original. This is what I want to see if we're actually going to stick with this goofy dimensional split between classic and modern Sonics. If we're going to go down that path, give me some dynamic changes between versions of characters. And I don't mean that just physically. Vector's personality is far more defined since Heroes. He now leads the Chaotix Detective Agency, with Espio and Charmy working under him. He's far more aggressive and short-tempered than his original sprites would let on, and seems to love money just as much as he loves music. Though, I mean, how much can he really love it when... Oh boy. Do you even have ears, man? Like, why Why do you have the headphones? I'm just kidding. Crocodiles actually have some very strong hearing. They're just shaped like that to prevent water from getting it. Anyway, I'm getting off track. So yes, he's a bit greedy nowadays, but can you blame the guy? He runs a small business. He has to focus a lot on money, even though I'm hearing that currency doesn't actually exist in the world of Sonic anymore, which is strange to me because it looks like Vector understands USD just fine. Seriously, how would there be no money in a world with magical jewelry all over the place? Place. They have slot machines the size of skyscrapers. Anyway, Vector is a croc at odds with himself. While he seems like an angry, rude reptile, only out to make a mint, he's actually got a head for this deductive detective business. And often the boys end up empty-handed after a job because they'll end up working for free if it's the right thing to do. And will turn down a client if they seem to be a little bit shady. Then again, they did end up working for Eggman in their first appearance as a detective agency, so take that for what it's worth. I personally found the detective stuff a little weird when I first came across it. I mean, I, I know the Archie comics were never canon, but the Chaotix just felt like Knuckles' crew to me. Vector and the rest of the Chaotix were part of a tight-knit group that helped Knuckles run the island. Still, I have to admit the detective dynamic grew on me. I really don't feel like any member of the old Chaotix crew got quite as much love as this guy. He's even showed up in Sonic Team Racing and Sonic Boom before any of the other Chaotix. And even with a shift in focus to playing detective, I do appreciate that his love for music is still strong. I don't really have a deeper interpretation about Vector to share with you guys. I know that's kind of my shtick, but I really just wanted to share some interesting tidbits about this croc. I know he's pulled a Justin Timberlake and made some moves in a solo career in recent outings, but I still feel like Vector works best when he's with the rest of the Chaotix. All of the Chaotix. And while I do appreciate the detective side of him and his crush on a rabbit mother, our boy seems to like older ladies, no disrespect, but kind of makes you wonder why he's so determined to get to a computer room, huh? What you Looking up, Vector. What are you up to? Anyway, yeah, I do like the detective stuff, but I really miss the old crew. And I am bummed to see this group grow smaller and smaller with each passing project. But whether or not he's a detective or just an avid fan of music, I'm happy Sega did not give up on that goofy design back at the start of the 90s, because he's evolved into a great character. And despite what you think of Sonic's extended cast, they could always use a little bit more green. So, quite recently, I put up a poll to see who was the most popular Chaotix member. And while I only had a small sample of the Sonic fanbase voting, we still had well over 6,000 votes and, uh, well, played out almost exactly as I expected. 
Almost. While I didn't expect Charmy B to win the contest, I certainly did not expect him to be dead last when I had also included characters that many would argue shouldn't even be among the choices. Yeah, Heavy and Bomb got more votes. I would guarantee a large chunk of people don't even know who those characters are. And seriously, look at the comments. You have more people complaining about who I didn't include than those genuinely upset about how bad Charmy was doing. <laughs> Which I found especially surprising because Charmy is one of the three Chaotix members who form the Modern Detective Agency, who keep showing up to fill out the roster of Olympic teams. Even when they're not really doing anything, they're still around. Of course, you could say that about most of Sonic's cast, but that's a topic for another time. Still, I guess it's understandable that he's not the favorite of the bunch. Even back in his reintroduction in Sonic Heroes, Charmy has been known to be, well, irritating. He's hyperactive, absent-minded, and just obnoxious. Not even anatomically correct, he's got a stinger! Female bees have stingers, not the males. Well. Who am I to tell the bug how to identify? Besides, if we're gonna compare him to real world insects, there are a few more glaring inconsistencies we should probably address first. Or address silly inconsistencies, like the localization for Knuckles Chaotix here in America. He's supposed to be a little kid in the Japanese game, but the American manual listed him as 16, which I guess is just a fun little factoid. Sure, that won't have some drastic repercussions down the road. Despite the fact that his character was intentionally made to be as obnoxious as a real world buzzing bug, he's still a consistent part of the extended cast of modern Sonic games. So I thought, what the heck? Let's dive into the history of the bug and see if we can find something charming about Charmy. But after doing some research, even knowing what I already know about the different canons of this character, I wasn't quite ready for what I did come across. I know I got corny and melodramatic while talking about Shadow the Hedgehog, but I feel like I should have saved all that sad energy for this video because things get rough. Now for those unacquainted, when I point to this guy and say he's a B, it would be reasonable for you to respond with, uh, no he's not. And well, fair enough, he threw me off the first time I saw him too. Being a giant insect should make him the most terrifying member of the Chaotix. I mean, Robotnik certainly knows what bugs are supposed to look like, but apparently in Sonic's world they share the same face as armadillos and hedgehogs. But hey, if you grew up with cereal mascots, this might not have thrown you off too much. Charmy does look like he's about to bust a honey nut all over your breakfast. But like most members of the Chaotix, Charmy's journey does not start off with the 32X title. He actually started off, like a surprising amount of things from this franchise, in the old Sonic manga, where he looked like that. You know, I've already made a lot of jokes about the wacky character designs from Europe and America, but somehow Japan managed to end up with the single worst Sonic character design I have ever seen. <laughs> this sad Muppet with a B but loosely attached is... Charmy B. Really and truly. He first shows up after Sonic's alter ego, Nikki, no relation, and his dad go flying off and then get caught in Eggman's cocktail shaker, which gets Daddy Hawk completely sloshed. But when he tries the same on Nikki, he turns into Sonic, so it's fine. So since Eggman can't roofie the hedgehog, he's instead going to try and drown him. But no worries, Charmy wakes up and uses the time box to reverse time to make sure none of this happened. And if that seemed to come out of nowhere, it did. It really did. It turns out Sonic comics were out of their mind crazy no matter where you grew up. What's the time box? Who is this bug in relation to Sonic? How did he just show up out of nowhere? None of, none of it matters. Nothing matters. And here he is again, with his ass being used as a toothpick by Chonker the Hedgehog here. They did give us a design closer to what we would know Charmy to be. <laughs> be. But even back then, he was still a complete pain for Sonic and Tails long before he became a detective. And when Knuckles Chaotix came out, he would find himself in the other two Sonic comic series, America's Archie Sonic and UK's Sonic the Comic. Let's start with the Fleetway comic as he seems to get off a little easier in this version. And if you grew up an STC fan who's never read the Archie book, that should raise a couple of concerns for you and we will get to them. Do you have a group of friends who has that one guy? You know the one. The one who just gets under your skin. The one you can't stand. Not even sure why they're hanging out with the rest of the group. Nobody likes them. You just talk crap about them when they leave the room. And then talk crap about them again when they come back into the room. If you don't know who that is in your friend group, it's probably you. And I should know because I am absolutely that guy. Ask any one of my friends in Iowa. They will back me up 1000%. They cannot stand me. And that guy is also UK Charmy. Seriously, the entire Chaotix crew cannot stand this insect. At first, I couldn't blame them too much. He just talks in stupid doodly words. He's like a British Ned Flanders. The Chaotix straight up kicked this dude out for just making too many stupid noises. <laughs> 
and even when Charmy saves them all from a group of villains when he returns home with his colony and straight up torches them and then turns them into pottery, even after all of that, the Chaotix are still like, get out, get you and your stupid family out. And Sonic is just the worst to him. He barely knows the guy and is just a total dick. <laughs> Even when Sonic comes across what seems to be a kidnap attempt on the bug, he seriously contemplates just leaving him to his fate. I mean, yes, he does go to Charmy's aid, but even then he's saying he's probably gonna regret this. Yeah, I guess I better help him, but... Uh, this dude sucks! And when Sonic discovers that these are actually royal escorts and they need to return Charmy to his hive for some reason, Charmy is allowed to bring a friend to speak on his behalf, asking Sonic to his face to be his friend in his time of need. Sonic's like, I am not your friend. His top priority before anything else is just to make it clear that he is not friendly with this damn bug. <laughs> but begrudgingly, he once again helps. And even when Sonic discovers that Charmy is royalty, and the bee asks the hedgehog not to tell the Chaotix, Sonic makes him swear that he won't ever tell the team that Sonic helped him out. His cred is that important to him. I do not want to associate with this loser whatsoever. I don't care what kind of royalty he is. This guy's a dork, and I want nothing to do with him. Seriously, you guys think Sonic was a dick in Sonic X? You have no idea. This this dude was an honest-to-goodness jerk in the UK book. Were you a nerdy outcast in school? Big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, but you don't really talk about it because you know the more popular kids will just mock you? Well, guess what, buddy? That's the type of person Sonic wants nothing to do with. He is that popular jerk who does not want to hang out with me. You does not want to hang out with you. It's okay to like children in the media as an adult, okay, guys? Stop making fun of me! It gets to the point where you honestly feel bad for the bee. And maybe relate to him a little bit. <sighs> God diggly damn it. He's there to be a punching bag, and he's under the impression that his friends are just playing around and don't actually mean all the horrible things they say. It was a lot more acceptable to just have your characters be dicks to intentionally obnoxious characters. But looking back on it today, this feels over the top harsh. He seems like a sweet kid, but is also a little delusional and a bit of a masochist. He's hanging out with the Chaotix crew by his own volition. He could easily return to his hive as a prince, but instead chooses a life where he's belittled by his whole team. At least in the modern version, there's still a sense of brotherhood between the detective agency. Charmy might be annoying to Vector, but it's in more of a kid brother kind of way. Espio and Vector still love the little guy. UK Charmy, hands down, gets the most disrespect compared to every other version of the character. But even when designed to be disliked, this is still not the worst the B had to put up with. <sighs> it's time to talk about Archie Charmy. Like his UK counterpart, he too was a prince of a royal hive who ran away from his duties. But thanks to Sega of America, this Charmy was a teenager. He's growing into an adult and would eventually return to take up his mantle and responsibility with his childhood friend, now fiance, Saffron, as his queen. So unlike the Fleetway version, he has no yippity yappity diddly dumbassity speech patterns. And his friends genuinely love him. He really is everything the British bee was not. And his life is trash because this bee has so much more to lose. Now, when it comes to Sonic comic writers on the American side of things, while there are plenty who have contributed to this franchise, there are two who stand out in any conversation. I am of course speaking of Ken Penders and Ian Flynn. Generally, nowadays, Ken gets a lot of heat, but you will still find loyalists who respect the world and lore he built in the older days. Ken was given free reign to get about as wild as possible because there was very little oversight and crafted something that was drastically different from everything else in the franchise. On the flip side, most fans generally love the work Ian Flynn put into the Archie book when he took over as head writer after Ken was fired, and was so beloved that they brought him on board when the Archie book was dropped and IDW picked up the license. Two very different creators, and for obvious reasons, generally if you adore the writing of one, you tend to dislike the work of the other. But the one thing these two writers seem to have in common is putting this bee through some real heavy shit. We would first discover Charmy's royal heritage in a knuckle story arc that kicked off with his childhood friend dying from an overdose of hallucinogenic drugs. USDC fans think the European book got dark? Well hang on to your hippity hop hats, because America goes hard, and we are just getting started. So this story arc was a take on a crime thriller in the world of Sonic, which leads us to the aforementioned bug buddy Odin in a dark alley. And later on in the same story, Charmy and the rest of the Chaotix end up having a bad trip on some 
LSD-laced chili dogs. Can you feel the sunshine? I can feel it inside me. I can feel it burning me. I am the sunshine. <laughs> And later on, we get this POV shot of Charmy undergoing surgery. And fun little factoid, a lot of comics in the 90s would represent their blood with black ink instead of red, mostly to skirt around some censorship. Oh, and would you look at that? There's some of Charmy's squirting out all over for all the children to see. The story ends with Charmy returning to his hive to bury his friend. But they weren't done here. Much later on, Charmy and Saffron would end up in Knothole to report to Sally that the Golden Hive colony had been destroyed and almost all of the hive captured in Robotnik's egg grapes. No, that's not a horrible fusion of fruit and fowl. That's a giant machine that harvests energy from living beans in grape-like clusters. And it's not some Matrix-like happy dream Dreamland crap. If we look at the little status bars on the sides of these things, it looks like they drain the life force of their victims while also apparently wiping their minds and infusing them with toxins. I don't know why, just to be extra dickish, I guess. I don't think we ever truly see the end results in the comic itself, but the writers have confirmed that yes, they will suck you dry and not in the fun way. Bust a honey nut. It really goes to show you how little of a damn Sega gave about what we were publishing here in the West. That is, until Ken and Archie caused a big enough ruckus to wake up Daddy in Japan and gave Kenders the boot. Now it was left in Ian Flynn's hands, and if you thought things would ease up for the little bee, well you might need to sit down for this next part. Alright, so going by my previous comic videos, you would assume I am a big fan of Ian Flynn's work, and you'd be correct, but I don't, for a second, think it's perfect. It's true, I'm a little more harsh with his detractors, and because of this you might think I'm biased and being unfair to other writers. And you know what, on some level maybe I am. While there is legitimate critique for his work, a lot of the more baseless complaints come from people who don't know what they're talking about. Who don't seem to understand that Flynn does not get free reign to do whatever he wants. He is writing for a licensed property, a mascot of a brand. This is a product to make you more interested in the franchise as a whole. And when you write for a corporate brand, it's not always about telling a story. It's also about solving problems and working in elements that the company wants in the book. It doesn't matter what they allowed in the past. If that's the direction they want to go with the brand, you will either figure it out or they'll find someone else who will. Ian came into the Archie book that had years of messy, messy canon and very little oversight. He needed to keep true to the world that had been built before him. I'll make it fall more in line with the game universe. And this time, Sega was paying much closer attention. That means means having to change up characters so they better match the version Sega made for the game. And if you recall, the American manual from Knuckles Chaotix listed Charmy as 16, but the modern version of the characters fell more in line with the Japanese version, who was 6. It did not matter to Sega that Charmy was treated as a young adult who was allowed to grow to a point where he was engaged to marry. All that mattered was that the game saw him as a child, so the book needed to reflect that as well. So, did they do that by messing with time? Some goofy age potion, maybe? No, 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 no. Oh, God, no. What they instead did was torture the bee in Eggman's egg grapes and left him as a bee. If you think I'm being insensitive, keep in mind that's a line from the Team Chaotix theme in Sonic Heroes, the same game where Vector called Rouge a broad. Yes, seriously, they did this. In the Archie book, pre-reboot, Charmy is still not a child. His mind has just regressed to the state of a child. I want you to seriously think about the repercussions of this. Are you engaged? Are you married? Do you have someone in your life you see as your life partner? Can you imagine what it has to be like for Saffron? Charmy isn't the same person. And not even that, he is practically a kid. She's engaged to someone with the mind of a child who doesn't even remember that he was once a prince to an entire colony. Can you imagine how heartbreaking that would be? She's no longer his romantic partner. She's his caretaker. And I'm not overplaying that either. That's literally how they describe her in the comics encyclopedia. Yes, Charmy is written more in line with the game counterpart, and that was probably fine for brand new readers. But if you had read everything leading to this point, seeing Charmy talk like this is sad and unsettling. And Gator Jesus help me, we are not done. Saffron doesn't get a lot in terms of character growth, but she is a sweet gal and you can tell she loves Charmy more than anything because she's still there. Charmy cannot be left to fend for himself. He needs her. And because of that, that means the bug still has something, no, someone, left to lose. 
Because Pender won the lawsuit that required Archie to remove all the characters he had a hand in creating, they had to get all of them out without so much as a goodbye. And while I keep reiterating that Ken did not make the Freedom Fighters, she did help create Saffron. So... Like all those Echidna OCs, Saffron was unceremoniously removed via Warp Ring, never to be seen again. This tiny little panel is where pre-reboot Charmy story ends, about to be told by Knuckles that Saffron is gone with no way of bringing her back. And yeah, they rebooted, and now Charmy is a happy-go-lucky kid, but wow! It's almost understandable that a handful of fans are still really ticked off with the way things were handled. Flynn himself has expressed regret with the whole brain damage business, going so far as to keep Charmy out of comedic situations as to not seem insensitive. And yeah, again, Ian was put into a tough place, but ugh, this absolutely should have been handled differently. And thanks to all the ugliness from that legal battle, we will never get proper closure for pre-reboot Charmy. Yeah, the stories were all over the place, but it all ends here, in a silent silhouette. So, yeah, pretty heavy stuff for such a little bug, huh? Putting all of that aside, in the world of the games, Charmy is a kid. He can be annoying, but... Honestly, it's hard not to like the little guy. Especially since he's hands down the most overpowered character in Knuckles Chaotix. I sometimes wonder if they put in that stupid ring tether just to keep this bug in check. Unlike Tails, he can always fly. Instead of jumping, he just starts in a direction, and yes, it kills anything. And as my uncle reminded me, you can pull off a Robotnik and swing around heavy like a wrecking ball, leaving you pretty much indestructible. Honestly, Charmy is a lot of fun to play. And while we would not get any more 2D adventures with the bug, it's little surprise that Naoto Oshima would go on to be both character designer and director of Pino Bee, a 2D platformer where you get to play, surprise, a bee. And... <sighs> Look, I really don't want to end on a downer note here. Charmy has been through a lot thanks to some overly dramatic storytelling. But that's Archie. That's kind of what they did. I don't think it should have ever happened to begin with. He's better off as a kid, and Flynn was very sure to establish him as a child the instant he popped up in the IDW book. And he's just great in Sonic X. He plays off well with the stoic SBO and the loudmouth Vector. He's just a happy kid, and that's who he's supposed to be. He's ADHD in insect form. Irritating as hell to the reptiles he hangs out with, but when push comes to shove, they love him like a brother. He's an integral part of the Chaotix Detective Agency, the Chaotix Freedom Fighters, and whether they like it or not, UK's Chaotix crew. Always sunny, always optimistic, and also a serious powerhouse in his first playable appearance. He doesn't need all this insane drama from the Archie series, but honestly, Saffron deserved way better. And apparently it still wasn't as bad as it could have been. Apparently there was a plan to take her out with piano wire at some point. For real, I do not understand how Archie got away with printing out this shit for so long. Charmy's never been my favorite character, and that seems to also be the case for a lot of you as well, but I appreciate the little guy and understand why people come to the defense of this bug. Despite all we as Sonic fans have lost over the years, I'm certainly glad Charmy is still buzzing around, because he makes this franchise just a little more charming. So unlike the Fleetway version, he has no yippity yappity dippity. He has no yippity yappity diddly dumbassity speech pander. He has no yippity yappity diddly dumbassity. God, it's so hard to say this line. Deep dot to the bottom. I'm a sky man. Skibbity bebop. Woody yippity yap yap. Da da. I hate this stupid bee. Welcome back to November Chaotix, where we're talking about everything Knuckles Chaotix. Now, fans who grew up with Sonic Heroes might know the Chaotix as a trio, two reptiles and an insect. When the group was first formed, there was also an armadillo among the ranks. Mighty the armadillo, a peaceful powerhouse who is very protective of his buddy Ray. At least that's how we know of him in a lot of American Sonic media. But as deeply rooted as this show back is in the Sonic franchise, there actually isn't a whole lot about his backstory or personality provided by the games proper. I actually had to jump back into Knuckles Chaotix just to play around with him because I legitimately did not remember what he was capable of. And it turns out there's not much. None of his playable appearances show off this apparent super strength of his. That was all cooked up by the western side of things. Outside of his name, Sega of Japan didn't really leave us much to go off of. And even with the name they couldn't get that right, there was a spelling error in the Japanese manual. Well thank goodness they didn't spell armadillo incorrectly. That's just one letter away from being hilarious. Now considering how obscure his first two appearances were, and the fact that his design just seemed to be Sonic with a bobsled on his head, there's little surprise that he felt all but for 
forgotten by the Sonic series. For years, gamers thought he went missing, only to surprise everyone with a return in Sonic Mania Plus, alongside a certain flying squirrel, who we will get to another day, I'm already covering so much this month, you guys. But I'm here to tell you, Mighty the Armadillo never left. He's been here the whole time, you just had to know where to look. Of course, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. As many of you Sonic nerds already know, Mighty, like the other Chaotix I have talked about so far, appeared in the franchise long before Knuckles' Chaotix showed up. Mighty actually might have existed before Sonic himself. As far as I can find, we don't have much in the way of concept designs thrown around Sega while they were trying to cook up a mascot, but it's heavily rumored that one of the creatures that was considered was an armadillo. Who knows how true any of that is, or what that early concept design would have looked like, but it's not too unreasonable to think that we almost lived in a world where Mighty the Armadillo was selling you a Sega Genesis. But speculation can only take us so far. Whatever the case is, they did decide to bring in an armadillo early on. And that's thanks to Manabu Kusunoki. I apologize if I'm butchering that name. While developing an arcade outing for Sonic, he needed to bring in other characters that could best emulate Sonic, and he wanted to keep in the tradition of uncommon animals. So he chose a flying squirrel and an armadillo. Thus led us to Mighty's very first appearance in the Sega Sonic arcade game. The game has you controlling one of three characters with a trackball as you do your best to escape Eggman Island. I had a chance to play one for myself a few years ago, and while we will do a proper review down the line, from what I remember, it really made me miss controllers. And like I already stated, not much here of no outside of Mighty's first playable appearance. Since he was designed to basically be another Sonic, he doesn't really do anything unique here, and he would not stop emulating Sonic when he made his big debut on on home consoles. Mighty, like most of the cast, was brought in from one of the more obscure parts of Sonic media, but unlike his teammates, he didn't have a whole lot going for him. Very strange considering, outside of Brad Red himself, Mighty is the only other member of the cast who was playable in a proper video game prior to this point. While everyone gets a unique move or two, Mighty gets a wall jump which is nowhere near as useful as climbing or gliding or directional air dashing or endless flight. That, and he's also the only one who doesn't get his own set of sprites. He's just a hand-me-down Sonic. And they didn't even bother with the updated design from Sonic 3. Seriously, even Knuckles got brand new sprites. What's the deal here? It's assumed by most of the fan base that Mighty was a last-minute replacement for Sonic himself. And, well, I mean, that's probably what happened. And for a while, that's all we seem to have of Mighty. But if you looked around in other media, you could still find him bouncing about. Over in the UK, we of course had Sonic the Comic, which took a much more aggressive approach for the armadillo. Instead of being a pacifist, he was more like a drunk football hooligan picking fights at pubs. Do I crack you, Rev? Are you blind? He's clearly traveling with the ball. Go Packers! Trip on the Bobby! <laughs> okay, that accent, just whatever. But do you even get the basics of football? You know, soccer? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, when you guys get on, uh, cleaning supplies and chase around a gold ball, right? No. Do you have any understanding of American football? Yeah, of course, you know, I agree. yeah, you know, American, I, you know, real cool boy does real cool boy things. Like, the, like, fo football with the yards and... It's not even a ball. It doesn't make any sense. Wait, what is this? A Madden review? Why are there so many anthropomorphic dogs in this marathon? Can't you read this sign? Get off my lawn, you stupid muck! This is still quite jarring from the personality I'm used to, but like I said in my STC video, I appreciate that I immediately know what this dude is all about the moment he jumps into action. They only have five pages per book to tell this story and he's not even the focus, but I do know he's a hothead looking to punch something. And I also know that this is not an animal man you want to get punched by. Still, he's not even the most interesting armadillo in this universe. That honor belongs to his senile dad who shows up and tries to kill Sonic with his manservant, who is force fed some natural drug that transforms him into a dinosaur. Getting upstaged by your own dad, Mighty, that's real embarrassing. Oh well, let's move on. Not long after SCC was cancelled, the Sonic series would move on to other consoles, and with Sonic Heroes, they would bring three survivors of the collapse of the Chaotix along for the ride. But the Archie comic would provide sanctuary for the armadillo, just as it had for the Freedom Fighters and so many other characters years prior. And there are some interesting tidbits about the history of this character. It comes from a family of thieves, spent some time at a slave labor camp, and his strength isn't a natural gift. It's actually been granted to him by Woolly Mammoth. And we will talk about those factoids when we talk about those stories. I don't think any of this is the reason why Mighty resonated with fans. This isn't why the character was relevant during the years Sega didn't make use of him. Through a lot
lot of the early years, Ken Penders handled most everything Chaotix. And going through those books, you can tell most of his focus is on Knuckles and his extended family. A lot of the time it felt like he didn't really know what to do with the Chaotix outside of being Knuckles' entourage. Mighty was no exception, he was known for being strong and that's about it. But even in his very first panel, I think Archie did a very good job of conveying what this version of the armadillo was all about. He smashes through a mountain and just casually strolls out, showing us that he has some raw, brutal strength, but has complete control over it. Immense power in a condensed package. He would get his own story when, later on, he'd get a mission to rescue Ray with Fiona Fox and Nick the Weasel. No relation. And then he'd go off on his own adventures for a little while once they started to bring in the more modern interpretation of the Chaotix. Also, apparently he's the reason Vector got jacked. That's pretty cool. Most of the attention that the armadillo would get would be near the very end of the pre-reboot era, in a story revolving around the Chaotix trying to track the guy down. And once they do find him, it looks like he's been shopping at Eddie Bauer. Look at those outdoorsy boots and the fingerless gloves. Oh, that's great. Oh, and athletic tape. You're actually one of the few characters that could use that stuff. Good job, Mighty. I guess the Archie team figured, well, if the games aren't going to use him, we'll modernize him ourselves. And honestly, I love this look. And I sincerely appreciated the Archie book for keeping the character around and doing their best to fit him in with the modernized designs of the other Chaotix. Also, this is just a fun story. And I like that it takes place in the desert because, you know, he's a, an armadillo. And <laughs> Oh, that's cute. And the story also revolves around Mighty trying to track down one of his long lost family members, this time being his sister, who is now Jax from Mortal Kombat. Also love that green shell. Nice callback. The only other female armadillo I've ever seen in this universe also had a green shell, so neat. This is just a fun story. Mighty is still polite. He's still defined by his need to protect the people he loves. And while he doesn't like violence, he loses his damn mind when he sees his sister get hurt. He's just the ultimate big brother. I love this guy. And while it was nice to see the Chaotix come back together, even if it's not in official game canon, unfortunately, immediately after this, they would reboot the entire universe. Thankfully, Mighty did survive the transition, but he did have a couple of differences. He's still a peaceful yet powerful guy, but also apparently has a bit of a short fuse. I wonder if this was an intentional callback to Sonic the Comics take on the character, or if this was just a convenient parallel for Sonic's Werehog storyline. See, by the time we meet Mighty in the rebooted world, he's already been through that journey. He had found a mentor in Moss the Sloth, who had helped him take control of the rage he had felt for being unable to help those around him when Eggman attacked. Sonic, having recently been infected by Dark Gaia, would also need to take that same journey in order to control the violent Werehog transformation. We'll explore this story and another time, but yeah, just to quickly gush, the Archie Werehawk did not have a handle on himself right off the bat like the original game. And that makes this version way more interesting, giving Sonic a distorted view on the world, letting his animalistic rage take over, and really messing up anybody who got in his path. They actually did something narratively interesting with this damn dog, and I for one appreciated it. He is genuinely terrifying. It doesn't look like anybody can take him on, except for Mighty the Armadillo. That's what I loved about the later Archie book and how they would take all these different characters and ideas that were introduced from all over the place in Sonic Media and give them new life. And that's no different from Mighty. Retelling some of the more modern game story but incorporating a long lost character was really cool. Almost played out like an alternate timeline where we did get Mighty. And here, in the comic, we would see him get into a fist fight with the stretchy wolf hog and it's awesome. We get to see both of these characters go, well, unleashed. This book just makes me wonder why on Earth, they kept splitting up the universe instead of taking advantage of all these potential mashups. Because that's what I see when I look at this interpretation of Mighty. And it was so frustrating that Sega wanted nothing to do with the guy. That is, until a little game called Sonic Mania had some DLC which brought him and Ray back for $5. I know I was not the only one who was overjoyed to see the Dillo make his triumphant return, and finally without being tethered to a ring! But it doesn't come as much of a surprise that Mighty had a wholly different moveset upon his big return in Mania Plus. While his wall jump got passed on to Modern Sonic, Mighty traded it off by learning Modern's drop ability. And maybe he's not lifting any heavy items to show off his strength, but maybe I should take back my comment about the game's never showing off that super strength, as the screen will shake once you meteor yourself into the ground. And I love that they actually incorporated his shell into the moveset. He can deflect projectiles and survive landing on spikes, just as long as you don't try
try to double dip in one jump anyway. And now he can collect Chaos Emeralds! We got a super mighty! That's rad! I mean, all it really does is make him look like a dimming light bulb, but one of the Chaotix has a super form! That's fantastic! But for real sake, you guys can even at least give us a shiny variant or... You know what? Whatever. I'm just happy he's here. Honestly, it's great to finally see this guy again after all this time, but it kind of sucks that he was gone to begin with. Critics want to talk about Sonic having a rough transition in 3D? Well, Mighty hasn't even had that transition. I mean, unless you count the special stages from Mania Plus, even then he's still trailing well behind the rest of the Chaotix. But from what we can tell, he actually almost did pop into the third dimension back in Sonic Heroes. We only have one tweet to work off of here, but apparently early on in the planning of Sonic Heroes, Mighty would have made his move to the modern with a team consisting of him, Ray, and Metal Sonic. Was Metal Sonic going to fight Neo Metal Sonic? Oh man, what if the original idea was Neo Metal was actually Mecha Sonic? Oh, and the Metal Overlord was actually like Metal Sonic Kai, but modern- Oh! Oh! I don't care how many Sonic clones there are. Us fans love this crap. Give me more Sonic robots. We'll keep coming up with more robot words. I don't care. Shiny Sonic, Iron Sonic. I got adjectives for days. Honestly, we have no idea if they even bothered drawing a single piece of concept art for this setup. But man, I would love to know the thought process behind this combination. Would Mighty have had any relation with a detective agency? What possible story could Sonic Team have concocted to have Mighty and Ray team up with Metal? Does that mean they're bad guys? Goons for hire? Maybe they don't realize how dangerous Metal is. Or maybe they do and that's what makes it interesting. I mean, Mighty would know who Metal is if they kept Knuckles Chaotix canon. Or would they have made Sega Sonic canon? I mean, clearly this combination is a callback to the three playable characters from that game. Or, or, or what if they're following the robot around because they think it's Sonic and they're just like baby ducks who follow anything they imprint on because they're adorable idiots? Would they have redesigned Mighty like they did with the other members? Maybe beef him out to show how strong he- Oh. Oh. Oh my. That's right. Well, make it look better than that. God, he looks like he ate Mighty. It's fun to think about, but ultimately, that's all it is. A fun thought. I cannot begin to tell you how happy I was to see the three Chaotix members we did get in Heroes, but it always bothered me that we never got the complete set. When Mighty showed back up in Mania, I thought that maybe this would be a chance to see a modernized version finally pop up in the 3D games. But nope. They instead used the opportunity of Sonic Forces to establish Modern Sonic and Classic Sonic as two separate beings from two separate dimensions with Azuga going out of his way to call Mighty and Ray classic characters exclusive to this new classic universe. Why? And look, I've had arguments on Twitter before. I get it. Some people really like some characters sticking with their defined universes and their defined art styles. You guys support segregation. That's your thing. Whatever. And look, whether or not you want classic universe and modern universe to be two separate things, would anyone actually be upset if the detective agency hired on a fourth member? I'd certainly welcome that with open arms. Mighty deserves to be fleshed out and he can stand out quite easily from the other members. Yes, he has super strength, and outside of that, he is one of the most loyal, most loving characters in this entire series. He uses that big protective shell to protect those he cares about. It's hard not to like this guy. Like, look at him, he's clearly good friends with both Sonic and Knuckles, who have been well known to want to punch each other in the face. He's that guy everybody gets along with. But he's also the guy that will put the fear of Gator God in you if you dare raise your hand to somebody he loves. He has become so much more more than a Sonic clone. And he shows us that family matters above everything else. And I, for one, feel like he's long overdue for a family reunion. Toot toot, mighty warriors. Help, I'm stuck. Oh, okay, no, it's just okay. I'm just on a channel that doesn't do animation. Okay then. You know, not that it's a bad thing or anything, you know, I'm not complaining. We all have our things we do better than others, I guess. I mean, not that it's a competition or anything, I mean, you've clearly got the most subs, but then again, I've been getting quite a few subs recently, you know. I mean, I'm younger, so if, if anything, it's more impressive, come to think of it. Oh my god, get out of my video! Welcome back to November Chaotix, where we're spending all month long talking everything Knuckles Chaotix. And we've been through a lot together this month, haven't we? Brain damaged bees, born again Christodiles, misplaced armadillos, and yes, we still have a game to review. But before that, we need to spend a little time talking about the coolest lizard in video games. Nice try, Gex. Maybe next tale time. But for today, it's all about Espio. 
Now I know a lot of you have been wanting me to talk about this chameleon for a while, but truth be told, I didn't even think we would make it to this point. Seriously, I have not stockpiled any of these videos. I am scripting, recording, and editing one right after the other as you see them. I about gave up and just said the SBO video is there, it's just invisible. I really need to learn better time management skills. And now I can! Thanks to today's sponsor, Skillsh- Nope, I uh, still don't have any sponsors. How does my channel have this many subscribers? I have no idea what I'm doing. Despite this being my hands down favorite character of the team when I was a kid, and apparently that seems to be the case for many of you as well, I didn't really think there was much to say about the lizard as he's one of the most underutilized characters in the entire franchise, across the board. I'm not talking just games here either. Despite the fact that he has a ridiculous laundry list of capabilities and a lot of strong evidence hinting that he was made for so much more. We know SBO today as the serious stoic member of the Chaotix Detective Agency. And he's also a ninja. He's a ninja detective. Okay. I suppose Vector can be a detective and also a DJ. It's good to have hobbies outside of work, but it just sounds like a little kid slapping together careers because it sounds cool. Maybe that's what it actually is. Charmy just has two scaly dads who are being very supportive and playing make-believe with their son. When you have a mystery to solve, you call the Chaotix Detective Agency. Also available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and stealth assassinations. As fond as I usually am of ninja reptiles, that's not what I want to talk about, at least not yet. You must first uncover the hidden history behind the character. Which is, um, well, there's not much. We've seen the Croc in Sonic's band, Mighty in the old arcade game, and the Bug in the manga. These three have been around, if not right at the start of the Sonic franchise, then at least real damn close to it. But believe it or not, Espio is the only member of the Chaotix that was created for the game Knuckles Chaotix. When I look at Espio's sprites, he just makes sense in this world. The music, the level design, the overall aesthetic, it all feels cohesive, as if it came from the same creative source. And, uh, well, that's because it did. Dr. Miyake, I'm so sorry if I'm saying it wrong, designed Espio and, well, most of the game itself. She was the chief graphic designer, character designer, enemy designer, level designer. A lot of her personal touch can be seen through the entire game. Probably won't surprise you to learn that later on she would go and design worlds and nights into dreams. And before this, was the chief designer of Rystar. I mean, seriously, you drop Espio into that world and he's gonna fit right in. Chaotix feels like it was built with Espio in mind, and that very well might have been the case. You've all seen Cybershell's video, we have evidence showing that there was heavy emphasis on the character and we know about its very messy development. The game was probably cobbled together and slapped knuckles on to make a few more sales, even if the giant lizard was clearly the favorite of the bunch. I mean look at the guy, even his sprites feel like they were made to be a technical showcase for the 32X. Look at that idle animation, hypersonic eat your heart out. He can't even be bothered to do a spin dash, he's got a tornado spin his way through loops. Honestly I get a lot of Michael Jackson vibes from the guy. And no. No, not in the creepy way. Thanks to the tornado twist, the front of his face with that permanent furrow, kind of looking like that tip down hat from Smooth Criminal, his shoes looking like something you could moonwalk in, and we know thanks to Space Channel 5 that Michael Jackson's relationship with Sega still existed after Sonic 3, and I feel like it's still present in classic Espio's design. It thoroughly inspired a lot of Sonic throughout these years, and wouldn't surprise me if that's the case here. Also love his running animation. Just charging ahead, horn first. I get it, chameleons kind of look like a triceratops, but those dinosaurs Dinosaurs had the skeletal structure designed to run their faces into things. Chameleons don't have that. That horn's just for show. SPO, you're gonna break your neck. Stop being an idiot. And yes, I have seen that random ass top 10 facts video about the lizard. That single horn does indeed mean he's a Meller's chameleon. I know, reptiles are rad. But speaking of chameleons, Sega once again took a very weird real world animal and turned it into a stylized cool cartoon. Honestly, I loved this. It felt like Sega just took all the leftover critters after Disney picked through all the popular choices. And once again, they took a trait of the actual animal and turned it into a superpower. In this specific case, they took a chameleon's ability to change color and gave Espio the means to turn completely invisible, which is uh, not actually something you can do in Knuckles Chaotix, as it would have served absolutely no purpose. Kinda sucks you can't turn invisible in the game, but then again, they did decide to forego the goofy eyes of the real lizard when designing Espio, so I guess we'll chalk that up as a fair trade. Oh, we can also just walk up the side of walls, like a proper lizard. Not sure if that's entirely fitting for a chameleon, I mean, don't get me wrong, chameleons will climb on whatever they can get their little claws around, but they do need to be able to grip. 
They can't stick to glass like geckos. But I mean, then again, Espio's doing it with his shoes, so... Who cares? Nothing matters. And Sonic the Fighter shows us that he has a real long tongue that can cause a lot of damage. Sorry, ladies. He's taken. So yes, design-wise, there was a lot of care put into the reptile. If you like Knuckles Chaotix, you're probably a big fan of the Purple People Eater. And this is all great and fine, but what about his personality? Well, outside of the American Manual, commenting on him being somewhat of a hothead, which is not the impression I get when I look at him, kind of feel like they just just took a look at this piece of art here with the spiky teeth and decided that this was just his constant mood. Anyway, yeah, outside of that, the original Japanese description actually nailed pretty much everything about the character right at the start. He is single-minded and has a strong sense of justice. His hobbies are combat training and gathering intelligence. And his job? Private detective. Well, I feel silly. I thought the detective stuff just showed up out of nowhere in Sonic Heroes. But turns out, Espio's always been at it. Makes you wonder why he's not running the show in the modern version. What I also found interesting is the manual also points out that he took interest in the island that had emerged as a result of the Master Emerald being so close to the planet's surface. Dude loves to investigate, and apparently he is envious of Knuckles for having a connection to an ancient civilization. I know that's not the same thing as a rivalry, but that would have made for a very interesting dynamic between the two characters. Also, he likes camping. Isn't that precious? I feel like Sega knew they had a cool character on their hands and tried to push him a little more in Sonic the Fighters. But like all the other members of the crew, he just fell to the wayside after a while. Thankfully, that would not remain the case. With the release of Sonic Heroes, they would bring back the Chameleon, and this time as a f Ninja. I still don't know if I prefer this take over the original design of the character. I mean, his look hasn't changed that much, and what they have changed, I don't hate. But I connect so much of that original design with that weird, colorful, surreal, dreamlike era of Sega. It feels like that's Espio's world, as opposed to playing second fiddle to a loud crocodile. But Espio is cool, and ninjas are also cool, so I can get behind it. His name is Espio after all, it's short for espionage, I get it, invisibility, sneaky spy stuff. Also, I keep forgetting that his name is short for espionage? I just like his name that much. It sounds so unique and cool. Espio. Ah, so cool. I do think, like a lot of others, he'd be fully capable of running the agency as its leader, and at times could probably do a better job than Vector, especially since apparently he's been doing it for a lot longer. But the dynamic works well enough. They're a lot of fun together. Espio clearly takes the ninja part a bit more seriously anyway. When he challenges Vector, it's only to help him be a better leader and keep the team focused up. As Stoic and serious as the lizard is, it's probably best to have the more personable reptile act as the face and hype man for the business. Besides, if Vector is the employer in this situation, it doesn't really matter if SBO is more qualified or not. He's a business owner. That's just how this works. I'm thinking way too much about this. The detective stuff aside, SBO has a massive list of abilities at his disposal. On top of the invisibility and enhanced speed, they revamped the character during the time when Naruto was at its peak. I'm gonna assume that inspired a whole lot of cartoon ninja crap for this character. I mean, he is a Sonic character with ninja reflexes, ninja stars and kunai, stealth abilities. How does he not have his own game? He is so cool. Have him sneak up on assassination targets, slicing necks with rings shooting off all over the place. Sign me up, that sounds rad. I think the only time we've ever had the modern interpretation playable outside of Heroes was... I think Sonic Rivals 2? I'm not gonna count the mobile games or Olympic games. It was cool to see him in Rivals 2, but again, he feels underutilized. And I know we can say the same about the rest of the crew, and honestly, about most of the secondary Sonic characters. But it feels especially egregious here because there's a lot that Espio can do that would make for one hell of a game. They just don't do much with them. I mean, not even the comics. I know I've spent a great deal of time with the Archie book when it comes to the Chaotix, and that's because that's where most of the interesting stories have come from since the games themselves haven't given us a whole lot to work off of. But unfortunately, even Archie comes up short when it comes to Espio. It did get a little interesting when they retconned a ninja backstory for the lizard, and he's just like, uh, yeah, actually, I was originally on a mission to spy on all of you. Also, Mighty, your long-thought dead sister is actually alive. Whoopsie for not telling you. I mean, I'm sure we could get into some very specific tidbits, but I'm really not feeling like diving into the Iron Dominion nonsense today. Maybe I'm just misremembering. Maybe there's some real cool scenes for the character. I don't know. Nothing really stands out to me when it comes to Archie Espio. Except for an awesome fight with Shadow Man in that first Mega Man crossover. And, now that I think about it, maybe that's where Espio shines. Not with extensive backstories or wordy dialogue. I mean, he is a ninja detective. This is a man of action. And my dudes, my dudes.
That is where IDWSPO stands out. We haven't covered it on speed reading yet, but if you're a fan of SPO and you have not read the Metal Virus Saga, get to it now. I won't say much, but when things get serious, you need a serious character, and SBO does not mess around. Skip ahead just a few seconds if you don't want to know anything, but at some point in the story, SBO snaps on Sonic for some of his stupid decisions, and it's a great, tense little scene. And even later on, Sonic's buddies have to split up to take on a Chaos Emerald powered Deadly Six, and SBO is the only one who has to handle one of them by himself. That one being Zaz. And man, it is just great. It's pretty much a tamer Naruto battle. Nowhere near as nuanced as a proper shonen manga showdown, but it's just great. You gotta trust me. Look, SBO's just really cool. It's a shame I don't have a whole lot to say about him now, but hopefully we will in the future. The whole point of this was just to tell you he's great. Even if I don't have a whole lot to pick apart like the other characters, he still stands out as my favorite here. You get the point. Sega, use your stupid characters. Toot toot, ninja warriors. Ninja vanish! Oh god, I hit the door! <sighs> really? We're seriously doing this? I gave you guys six videos last month. Six. And it's still not enough? All month long, I'm getting, where's SBO? Where's SBO? How come no SBO? And the moment I give you that Barney Lizard, all I'm getting is, where's Heavy and Bomb? Where's Heavy and Bomb? Why no Heavy and Bomb? Who actually cares? I was gonna try and do the actual review over Knuckles Chaotix, but nobody's even asking for that. They just want these two stupid robots. Is there even enough content to justify a whole video about these two? Well, of course there is. Who are you talking to here? Welcome back to November Chaotix. Nope, scratch that. Welcome to Chaotix Plus. That's right, we're going into overtime. I'll give you a few more details a little bit later, but for now, we got a couple of robots to talk about. Yes, fake rage aside, we are actually going to do a video about these two. Because who else would? This is the exact channel you go to for some random crap like this. I have to admit, I have always wondered what's the deal with these two robots ever since they were first revealed back in 1995. You see, they're not technically a part of the Chaotix team. They were instead known as Mechanics. Cute name, but also their literal job. In the manual, they are described as Robotnik's Mechanics gone rogue to help out Knuckles and his friends. And it doesn't really give us more information than that, but they do throw in a question to leave you pondering. The manual also asks if these two are actually friendly, or are they serving as double agents to slow down the Chaotix? And that is a fair question. They're not on the cover in any region, they're not on the title screen, they're not even in the player select screen. Well, you can't even play them outside of some very specific instances. If you're going single player, you can swap characters with the proper monitor power, or you can throw one of the robots into one of the magic giant rings to have them go through the bonus stage or special stage. I also just love that Bomb just drops. Like any other character, they're spinning their little hearts out, but Bomb here is just like, oh, whatever, I'm good. And of course, if you have a second controller, the second player can play one of these two robots. Also, fun little note, even though these characters are often portrayed together, you can't actually play the two of them at the same time in Chaotix. Not without a code, anyway. Which we're just gonna use here, so we have some footage to use for the video. Now, these two aren't considered main characters because they actually serve more as a punishment than anything else. While Heavy is indestructible, he will drag you down, and while Bomb is lighter, it will explode at the slightest thing. That can take out other badniks, but it can also hurt your player character as well. So I can understand the trepidation when considering them allies. Oh, you're a walking bomb? And you want to attach yourself to me? Sure, I see no problems in that. Here, buddy, have a ring. Also, I never noticed this as a kid when looking at the choices in the combi catcher. I just assumed that they doubled up characters just for the sake of variety, but the only characters that have multiple copies are the two robots, which would imply that Robotnik made multiples for you. Now, as far as their true allegiance is concerned, it can go one of many ways, and quite frankly, all of them make sense to me. Eggman loves his carnivals and theme parks. And just look how he set this place up. What's the actual purpose to any of this? It's just a big, dumb game for him. The Chaotix are rats running around his maze, and he threw in some extra partner bots just for the sake of the experiment. But while it makes perfect sense for Robotnik to make intentionally obnoxious robots, it would also not surprise me if he made these robots genuinely genuinely believe they're doing a good thing, or he could have accidentally created sentience. I look at his later creations, and I'm still not entirely sure either way. Robotnik is a weird, crazy dude, but that actually is why these two little robots are so important and super underappreciated. These two were the first of robotic rebels in Robotnik's ranks. General, Gamma, Omega, all rebelled against Dr. Denver Omelette. Is it too crazy to assume that these guys wouldn't either? And I know I'm not the first person to come up with that thought, that's nothing new. But when 
when I look at these two characters and look at all the different ways Robotnik could have intended their creation, I feel like they fall somewhere in the middle. And if there were modern interpretations, I feel like they would fit right about here. The more I think about it, the more I don't understand why Heavy and Bomb couldn't have taken the place of Orbot and Cuba. And I know that sounds sacrilegious to some of you fans, I've warmed up to those two as well. But seriously, they'd fit right in. Both pairs are fun-sized, not really a danger, and also not really bad guys either. Yeah, they help out the Doctor, but it almost feels reluctant. They've been around Sonic and Pals before, they don't seem to have any intention to hurt the Animal Buddies. Now, Orby and QB here are the latest in a long line of robotic duos for Robotnik, but I think this is the first time he's ever had a pair like these in the video game. Before that, we had a pair of robots in Sonic X and, of course, Scratch and Grounder in the old American cartoon. And Heavy and Bomb have never been portrayed in this dynamic, but you could see how it could work, right? Maybe neither of them speak, they just express themselves through action. You could even have the pair of them in the modern games as failed prototype partners before Eggman moved on to the Shape Bots. Ooh, or the Robot Rejects that are now helpers over at Tails Workshop or the Detective Agency. How great would that be? That'd be so great. Look at their one wonderful little faceless designs. They do look like rudimentary simple robots that Eggman rejected without realizing that he had stumbled upon artificial sentience. Throwing out these two without realizing his own genius. He does have a history of creating proper artificial intelligence and never taking advantage of that in the games. There is so much potential, I'm just spitting out ideas here. My point is there can be a place for these robots, both on the side of good or as comical lackeys, because we've seen both play out before and you can even fit them back into the canon without replacing the beloved ball and box. Well, that probably won't ever happen. You're likely never going to see these robots in the modern game. Mm, hello, who are you? Yeah, so um, apparently Bomb shows up in Sonic Lost World. Okay, this is actually just a Bomb badnik. These have been around since the very first Sonic game, and Bomb from 32X, I guess, is just a more advanced version of this robot. But you can tell from the latest color scheme that that's clearly a callback to the character we're talking about today. Unfortunately, we can't say the same for Heavy, though. As far as I can tell, there are no cameos of this guys, so if you know something I don't, please let me know in the comments. Closest I can find would be in name only with the hard boil heavies from Sonic Mania, but obviously those are egg robos, those are not the goofy little salt shaker dudes with boxing gloves. So yeah, that's quite the stretch, but if anybody was ever going to do a mention of these two again, it's probably Christian Whitehead and the rest of the team that made Sonic Mania, so wouldn't surprise me at all if they show up again in a future throwback platformer. But that's really all you got in terms of the game. Games. Thankfully, the comics are a different story, and we're going to skip Fleetway entirely because they don't even show up in the UK book. But they did show up in Archie, and while it's not a lot of stuff, it's still a significant amount to discuss. And I will once again say, I hate their stupid faces. I hate these faces so much. So yes, like I went over when I covered the Chaotix book, they first showed up with Mighty, who befriended them first because of course he did, he's such a sweet boy. And in this canon, they did confirm that they were built a bit too well and gained sentience having stolen power gems from Robotnik to help out the rest of the Chaotix. And while they were a large help in freeing the Freedom Fighters and all that, strangely, they would just disappear after this, only to show back up in a closet, I guess. They would actually be recruited by Skunky St. John as part of the Kingdom of Acorn's secret service, going on secret missions for the King. And honestly, their stories are pretty fun, and these missions would lead to some pretty significant characters for the Archie canon, including Elias, Sally's long-lost brother. And it was good to see the robots again, but they didn't really do much outside of fill out the roster. Even Knuckles doesn't acknowledge the two of them when they come across the Guardian on a mission to find out what happened to Sally's mother. Also, I think this is the only time Bomb ever speaks. Throughout all these years, I never realized that he never spoke, but the moment he did here, it just threw me off. He never does it again after this scene. These would be the designated roles for the robots for a little while, but unfortunately, the good times couldn't last. During one of their secret missions, they were captured and reprogrammed by Eggman, then returned to the animal people as sleeper agents and that would all come to a head in this issue. Yeah, how many of you have scrolled past this cover in the Sonic Mega Collection completely unaware that this psycho was indeed a video game character? Oh, Sonic, don't run away. Bomb just wants a hug. In this issue, Heavy would produce a ton of mini bombs and hold the Acorn Royal family hostage, only to be quickly dispersed by Sonic before Heavy could even finish a sentence. The mini bombs themselves then deactivated by an EMP wave created by Rotor and Tails. And then that's it. Sonic and Pals don't 
don't even talk about having to take out their former allies once they're destroyed, but they would reappear a couple years later, once again as Eggman Badniks, but this time with their proper faceless design. Bomb is once again coming in a multi-pack, and I guess they drew him holding on to a sling ring for some reason. I don't think they realized that was just part of a game mechanic and not part of the bomb design, but whatever. And Heavy would be reintroduced as a heavy hitting robot, with Sonic even commenting that one hit from him could take him out, which doesn't make sense because they never showed Heavy being that powerful prior to this point, and Sonic did take out the older model in one shot. Still, I guess they had to give him something to do, but of course, Sonic saves the day pretty quickly, even with one last surprise bomb nearly taking out Mina Mongoose's horrible manager and boyfriend, Ash. Doesn't do the job, which is a shame for all of us. I really hate that character, but that's for another time. Thankfully, this would not be the final time we saw the robotic duo, as once again, years later, they would be rebuilt, but this time by Rotor and Tails, who had salvaged their core program, meaning that these are the original characters, but now with their video game design. And they do get some decent attention this time around. Not like the central focus, but they're actually in the middle of action and spouting some dialogue, with poor Heavy here even showing some concern that if he gets blown up once again, he won't be recovered. And I like that they take the time here to have Rotor say that's not going to happen on his watch. It really felt like the Freedom Fighters didn't care in the slightest when they were destroyed by their hands twice over. But here, as part of Team Freedom, that shows that's not the case. They haven't been forgotten, and they're still considered an important part of the team. I also love this entire page. Heavy and Bomb are ready to tackle Metal Sonic, commenting how it's like the good old days. But back then, all three of these robots had some pretty terrible redesign. Now, all of them face off in their proper forms. But before they can engage Metal Sonic, they're saved by Char. And if you know the history of this character, you know that this is the original model they fought back in that Chaotix comic. And now he has returned to battle this newer Metal Sonic. Just callback after callback on this page. I love it. We would see them one final time right before they're about to face off with the Tails doll. It's, yeah, all of it's great. It's fun stuff. But that's really about it. Right after this, the Super Genesis wave would hit. We'd have a Mega Man crossover, and that would be that. We would not see the robots ever again in the Archie book before its cancellation, and it's likely we will not see them again in modern Sonic games outside of that quick cameo from Lost World. All my jokes aside, these two do make me smile. I'm a sucker for their little goofy faceless designs, and despite the jokes I've made about the Archie book in terms of its quality being all over the place and how far it strays away from the source material, they didn't have to reuse these two characters, but they still kept coming back to them year after year, which I greatly appreciate. It goes to show us that these two characters do matter and they do have stories worth telling. And I don't want to leave this video on a heavy note because these characters are the bomb. Yes, I can feel all of you groaning at that joke and it fuels me. A few years ago, I didn't even think a game like Mania would ever happen again. So who knows what the future holds? Maybe we will see these two again. Now, it was originally at this point I felt I had talked about everything I could potentially say about these two little robots, but as I was playing the game with the two of them, just to get some footage for this particular video, it dawned on me that there's a lot more missing potential here than I realized. I've played Knuckles Chaotix so many times over for these videos and the upcoming review, but I had not once put in the code to play Heavy and Bomb at the same time. I have never done that that. And when I finally did, I found myself wanting to play the entire game with them. You can't actually do that. There are some portions in some of the stages that require some of the secondary abilities of the other characters, but playing these two forced me to rely completely on the rubber band mechanic. And it was really only at that time did I realize how much I was trying to force these other characters to play as standard Sonic characters. But when you're playing a couple of little robots, you don't have the expectation to spin down. It felt like these little guys were trying to innovate and pull off whatever nonsense they could with whatever was available. And you know what? I kind of wish the Chaotix was just a game specifically about these two robots. Yeah, it's not perfect, not by any means, but I think that's one of the greatest failings of the game. If they were so obsessed over this rubber band nonsense, they should have had characters that relied solely on it. When you attach any of these other characters, it really feels like they're dragging each other down. But with Heavy and Bomb, I can see so much potential to make them work together because that's what I had to do while I was playing them. And it was actually pretty fun. And I can already see the goofy story forming in my head. Two little robotic 
like Rebels trying to escape Eggman's factory. That's really cute, and that would have been really interesting. I'm going to play this a little bit more, so by the time we come around to the actual Chaotix video, I'll have this idea a little more fleshed out. But yes, joking aside, playing with Heavy and Bomb really and truly made me appreciate the rubber band nonsense in ways I had not all these years prior. So yes, they are low-key, potentially, some of the best characters ever produced by this series. This started off as a quick little appreciation for these two, and now we have a video that's longer than the Hespio episode. What am I doing? <laughs> you know what? What the hell? Sega, I want these guys back. They're adorable, they bring out the best of each other when they're tied together with a magical set of rings, and they make me believe in a goofy mechanic I had always just tolerated up to this point. I want to see a game taking advantage of these two. I am done underestimating Heavy and Bomb, and I hope after this video, you give these little guys a second chance as well. Because they are not only worth remembering, they are worth bringing back. Welcome back to Chaotix Plus, and what a marathon it's been. We went through all of these characters, gave them some time to shine, and... Uh, huh. Looks like we missed somebody. It is a little strange that in this Knuckles Chaotix coverage, we have not yet covered Knuckles. Once the badass rival of Sonic, the last of his kind, the guardian of the Master Emerald and the floating Angel Island. But nowadays... You don't know the way. Yes, do. do you know the way? The meme! Approved! <laughs> Careful not to stain your brand new dress, Pumpkin. I'm Knuckles the Echidna. I'm from Angel Island. I'm the beloved leader of this group and the last of my kind. Yeah. This is what one of the coolest characters of the Sonic franchise has been reduced to, or inflated into. An idiot meathead cartoon stereotype and a dead meme. It's literally the name of the toy that they made of this guy. Is that even allowed to be made? I d well, I mean, the Laura Sue Chronicles are fine. I guess this is. Yeah, the most attention this character has gotten in recent years are these chunky renditions, and even these have lost their luster. I know some of you already typing in defense of Boom Knuckles, and fine, yeah. He worked in the dynamic of that show. I have opened laughed multiple times and more often than not it's because of Chesty the Echidna. But I'm gonna be real with you. I got my fill. I'm good. I don't need this to be what people think of when they think of Knuckles. I've warmed up to the character but I still hate this design. Especially since I've seen fans reinterpret these proportions in much better ways than this. I enjoyed the humor but this character type was tired long before Boom came out. I'm honestly glad this weird little experiment is over. People miss the genuine humor and character interactions because we are so so desperate for that in the games. That's what they need to salvage from Sonic Boom. You roll that clever wit into mainline Sonic and you have solved so many problems with that series in terms of storytelling. I'll talk about the good and the bad with that whole mess another day. This was fine, but this is still not the Knuckles I know and love. And if there was even a hint that this would have replaced the mainline guy, forget it. No thank you. His other quite notable appearance is what the internet refers to as Ugandan Knuckles. But despite the fact that this seemed to take over the internet, it. Like any meme, it burned brightly then quickly faded. If you're watching this in the far future and somehow have not seen this bug-eyed boy, Ugandan Knuckles originally came from a design from a joke in a video by Gregzilla, which I'm gonna link to right here and in the description. Later on it would be paired with some choice lines from a film called Who Killed Captain Alex? A goofy Wakaliwood movie. Then, well, plenty of people thought it was hilarious. There was another portion of folks that were calling this problematic saying that this was portraying the culture of Uganda in a negative way, reinforcing negative stereotypes. I personally don't agree. I just saw this as a goofy version of a character that was born from two different goofy sources. It's called Ugandan Knuckles because Wakaliwood was born in the slums of Uganda. That's where Captain Alex was made. I'm just telling you where I stand. I think it's harmless. I think it's funny. If you have a different opinion, I respect that. I'm more than happy to hear you out in the comments below. Either way, that's not the point of this video. I need to stress that I don't hate either version
version of the character here. Like I said at the front, they've lost their relevance. They're gonna fade into memory of internet meme culture. And I've personally got plenty of laughs from both of them. But it still bothers me that this is the most relevant Knuckles has been in years. One's a dumb joke that has Polygon writing articles declaring it racist. The other was designed for memes in a failed spin-off series. And what truly bothers me is that the source material where these jokes spring from aren't offering us anything worth looking deeper into. These memes aren't born from some incredible Knuckles media. Sure, they exist because people have some residual knowledge of Knuckles. He's been in great games, but he's never truly been the focus. Sega has, time and again, failed to take full advantage of this incredible character. But there is a better path. Let me show you the way. That was a Ugandan Knuckles joke I was making just now. I promise I'm not racist. Part of the reason I did not yet cover Knuckles in this Chaotix Marathon was because I already went on a great deal about my guy and my Sonic 3 coverage. Another part of it was because I did want to shine a spotlight on some of these more obscure Sonic characters. But another large part of it was because there isn't much to say about the Echidna in terms of this game. The one game that has his name attached to it. Say what you will about Shadow's spin-off game, but it at least stayed on point in terms of storytelling themes it presented, and it did what a proper spin-off should do. While Sonic is the main hero in his games, he's usually stumbling across a story that heavily revolves around the history of a rival character. It's in this way that we, the player, learn about the enemy alongside the blue blur. As the story plays out, we develop empathy and respect for them. It might even leave you wanting some more. Sonic's gone off to his next adventure, but what about all the loose ends for this mysterious new rival? A good spin spin-off story will center on this new character to flesh out whatever history or lore was unearthed. In Shadow's case, you had Sonic Adventure 2 leading into Shadow's title game, which did give you more of all of Shadow's story bits. If you wanted to learn more about Shadow's origin, Gerald Robotnik, Maria, the Ark, how he survived, why the ultimate life form is a black hedgehog. Well, okay, it doesn't answer every single question, and honestly, I feel like it bloated out the history a little bit too much in spots, and ultimately, it's not a great game. They did stay focused on Shadow the entire time, in theme, story, and gameplay. Again, not perfect, but in this sense, it beats out Knuckles' Chaotix, because that game can exist without Knuckles just fine. I mean, I literally did just do a segment about how this game might have worked out even better if they had focused on the two faceless robots they had created to hinder the player. A massive reason why Sonic 3 and Knuckles is so damn good is because of... Well, Knuckles. He's so good that they had to awkwardly slap his name onto the complete adventure. The game went out of its way to design paths and boss encounters exclusive to Knuckles' unique abilities. They already showed how Sonic worked just by himself in the previous game, but with Knuckles, it's different enough that you can create entirely new challenges. Gliding and climbing makes that much of a difference. The incentive to explore pushed along thanks to giant hidden rings for the special stages. Not only that, but the connection with the Master Emerald, being the last of his species, and I and floating in the sky that nobody was aware of prior to this point. Yeah, we had a grand adventure focused around all of this, but when Sonic moved on, we could slow down and really explore the mysteries of this island and Knuckles' connection to it. All of that is just begging for a spin-off game. But that's not what we got with the Chaotix. Instead, we focused on sling rings and all these colorful new characters. And that's all pretty well known at this point. Knuckles' name doesn't even pop up in the Japanese version of the game. They just put more focus on him in the Western world to sell more copies. There is plenty to appreciate from this game, and there are hints at extending the lore a little bit, which I will get into at a different time. And none of this would be a problem if they had just done more with Knuckles outside of the Chaotix. And I mean, in some instances, they got close. The comics, both Fleetway and Archie, will continue to focus on Knuckles in solo adventures, especially with Archie. With the lack of oversight from Sega and Archie, Ken Penders would go on to establish answers for Knuckles' lineage and connection with the giant gem, utilize the Chaotix as a supporting cast of heroes along with some comic exclusive characters even bring in some unique villains. Now, whatever you think of Ken and his ugly breakup with the franchise, it's hard to argue that he really delved into the character in ways the game's never bothered with. I don't agree with each and every choice he made. I do think it gets a little too involved with tedious politics and a bloated cast and awkward teenage garbage. And frankly, it gets flat out boring a lot of the time. But this certainly deserves a more thorough analysis. It went pretty hard for a comic made for a children's license. And it certainly isn't the most insane thing from comic 
comics in the 90s. It does, in its own unique way, scratch that Knuckles itch. You wanted more from the Echidna and Angel Island lore? Well, Archie had you covered. And again, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper at a different time. I mean, comics are all well and fine, but it still doesn't solve the problem of the games. It's not like they were going to dive any deeper into Knuckles' history there. Well, that problem could have been potentially solved with Sonic Chronicles, the Bioware-made RPG for the DS, as that centers around an Echidna clan, and it's the closest the Archie lore ever got to the game canon. But Chronicles isn't great, and it's not even a platformer. It's a traditional RPG, and the real-world drama surrounding that title is far more interesting than the story itself. I mean, there's interesting stuff there, but trust me when I tell you that this mess deserves its own analysis, again, at a different time. They did have some potentially neat story ideas, and if that had been allowed to continue, maybe we would have seen even more for Knuckles in terms of a story. Honestly, with the legal fallout from all of this and Ken Penders, I'm worried that we might not even get anything related to Knuckles' history going forward. Well, putting all that aside, even though Chronicles isn't going to continue and Knuckles Chaotix failed to deliver the goods with the title character, I did still see some promise in the third dimension. I know we all love to endlessly chatter and debate over how Sonic should work in 3D. Honestly, it's not a hard problem to solve. Sega just loves to overcomplicate things. This past decade, there have been more than a couple of attempts to emulate the success of 3D Mario, which has been met with mixed results, and as more time has passed, more complaints seem to fester. Sonic was designed to offer something different from Mario, and I don't really think that should change with 3D titles. The adventure and boost games throw out so many potentially fantastic ideas in terms of game design and storytelling that Sega keeps coming close to but never quite nailing. They have everything they need to make Sonic stand out and good lord. That is a whole topic that the entire fan base loves chatting over for hours. Look, if they really wanted to challenge Mario after he once again revolutionized gaming in the third dimension, I feel like there was real promise, not with Sonic, but with Knuckles as the next big rival to the plumber. Look, if you really wanted to delve into the well-realized world of 3D Mario, you can do that with a unique spin and at the same time solve another major problem with the Sonic franchise, proper utilization of the extensive cast of characters. Goodness knows I've banged that drum plenty, but as much as I would love to see these more obscure characters get some time to shine, it's honestly aggravating just how many chances they had to make Rad Red relevant. As excited as I was to play Sonic in 3D, I was probably just as excited to see what Knuckles could do. I love exploring game environments. I have a whole show dedicated to it. And Knuckles made that fun. Even in Sonic R, he is hands down the best of the standard characters. Breaks the racing of the game, but whatever, man. This was Knuckles in 3D. It felt great gliding over the environment. And Sonic Adventure further bolstered my my hopes. And when it comes to Knuckles, yeah, it's mostly just levels filled with games of hot or cold. But Knuckles controlled great. Wasn't as zippy as Sonic, but the jumping and running still felt as good as ever. Climbing up walls and soaring across the open little maps. And they even got you punching and digging and utilizing his little mitts in different ways that the 2D games never bothered with. And the story continues on from Sonic 3, as a mysterious water monster bursts out of the Master Emerald, the most powerful bit of jewelry in this world. It just gets destroyed by this brand new baddie who's literally named Chaos. They hint at the ancient past of the Echidna tribe and the origins of the floating island and yeah, wow. It seemed like there was a lot of interesting stuff to unearth with this character. I've gone on about it before, but Knuckles was truly one of the first major sources of history and lore in the Sonic game world. Surely it would be nothing but upward momentum from here, right? Well, Sonic Adventure 2 was fine, but they made the destruction of the Master Emerald like a normal, everyday thing. It was a big deal when a god of destruction named Chaos bursted out of it. And sure, you could say that maybe Knuckles' connection with the stupid thing gave him the ability to crush it into pieces, but I don't know. It just felt like it was here because, well, Knuckles was hunting it down in the last game and we had to give him something to do in this game. And that's not to say they didn't have interesting ideas with Knuckles, or Rouge as well in Sonic Adventure 2. I mean, who can hate Pumpkin Hill? But, yeah, ultimately, they just didn't do enough with the character to satisfy me as a fan. Look, I get that they designed Knuckles' stages as they did back in the days of the Dreamcast because his climbing and gliding might end up demanding a lot of real estate. So they tended to cage the boy with high walls, occasionally unclimbable surfaces, or indoor arenas. And none of those are a bad thing, I just don't think they were utilized to the best of their ability. But nowadays, we are far past those limitations. Man, looking back on it now, I think all of this is why Pumpkin Hill was such a standout level. 
It's here that Knuckles gets to stretch his dreads and really let loose on this map. And also it's just a great aesthetic. Who doesn't love a good Halloween level? This isn't just a standout for Knuckles, but for the entire game. It feels grand, somewhat challenging, and super fun to explore. You need to properly utilize the gliding and climbing if you want to properly search this map. But I wanted to do so much more than just hunt down emerald shards. What's going on with that creepy church? Or that ghost train? I want to know the story of this place and I want to uncover some of these mysteries. Honestly, if you approach this as a Mario 64 game with unique objectives that required you to navigate the environment with your skills at hand, this could have been something incredible. I mean, for crying out loud, Spyro is basically a Knuckles game. He glides, he runs into things, he collects gems, and they sorted all this out on the PS1. You tweak that just the idiotic bit and you have yourself a Knuckles Collect-a-thon 3D platformer on your hands. You don't need to worry about zipping through the environment as quickly as possible. That, all right, I'm, I'm just spitting this out as I go. Just to backtrack, that would have been a great solution to the lack of Sonic on the Saturn. I know the system didn't handle 3D very well, but it did manage a couple of okay 3D platformers. I'd have happily played a low-poly 3D Knuckles platformer. Are you kidding me? That'd be rad. I mean, come on, even take out the 3D for a second here. A 2D game based solely around Knuckles would have been incredible, and that's kind of what I expected back in 1995. Or, hey, you know what? Even look at the Chaotix again. That was originally planned at one point to be a Saturn game. What if they just held off on that stupid 32X business and really gave it time to cook and plan out all those ideas and really make something special for the Saturn? I know 3D was the new hotness, but I certainly want have complained about that. That would have been incredible. And speaking of 2D, I do remember on one of Ian Flynn's podcasts that he mentioned that he would love a Metroidvania style Knuckles game. That'd be brilliant. Give me that. Or let's jump ahead into the future. How many times have you heard, well, you'd like Sonic Unleashed just fine if it was called Sonic and Knuckles 2? First off, how dare you? But the idea holds some merit. If you're going to make a combat-focused Sonic game, why not use a character who's never had a chance to properly utilize his spiked box Gloves. We still have to work in the climbing and gliding and hopefully speed up that sluggish dog to actually make the combat engaging. Man, that'd be really cool. Yes, thank you to whoever is about to type, am I the only one who likes the werehog? No, you're not. It shows up in multiple comments anytime somebody mentions Sonic Unleashed. I know you guys like that game. I get it. You were too young for God of War, so you got Dog of War and it did the job for you. My silly idea can't change history. That game still exists and it does do a lot of cool things. Can you spare me the comment? Please? No? You already wrote it, didn't you? Probably wrote it before I even mentioned Sonic Unleashed. No, I'm, I'm not giving you a Why Werehog Matters video. It's, it's not happening. Stop asking. Go to Channel Pup's video. He talks about Chip for like 15 goddamn minutes. You can tell I'm tired when I start derailing like this, so let's, uh... Let's wrap this up. Like I just said about the Werehog, that applies for all of these silly ideas. I can't change the past. I'm only playing Captain Hindsight and pitching you ideas that never came to be. Sure, it would be interesting to see Sega challenge Mario with Sonic's in-house red rival, but that's not what happened. And really, who's to say Sega wouldn't have screwed up future Knuckles solo titles like they did with the Chaotix, or like they did with Sonic himself? It all boils down to the talent of the developers and the bankroll and time frame provided by the publisher. But here's the neat thing about all these silly ideas I just threw your way. There's no reason none of this couldn't happen in the future. We certainly welcome back old school Sonic with open arms with Mania, and you know they're going to be coming out with a sequel to that game in some form or fashion. But eventually they're going to need to branch out. What if they were given a proper budget to give Knuckles his own unique campaign alongside Sonic and Tails and whoever else they use? Something beyond an underground path that you can take in the same levels that those guys traverse. Or why not just give Knuckles his own unique 2D game, release it digitally? Or in more modern settings, in a gaming culture obsessed with open worlds, why not chase that trend with Knuckles? Everyone loses their damn minds when Link can climb on everything or when Mario runs around little planets, but Knuckles has been dabbling with this shit for years. And yeah, I know Mad Space was a rouge level and everybody hated it, but what made that level so frustrating was the fact that you were once again playing hot and cold. That could have been a great environment if they gave you other tasks and objectives to partake in. I don't understand how all the boost games use the same damn excuse over and over again. Sonic's boost levels are so damn fast that we need to pad it out with something else. But they never bothered to use these other characters that could make for some excellent padding. And when they come close to a brilliant idea, they just throw it out instead of polishing it up. Sonic Unleashed is not Sonic & Knuckles 2, but what's to stop them from making Sonic & Knuckles 2? Refine that combat and get
give it to Knuckles. Or an open world Angel Island. That gives you the map borders, you can climb on everything and glide fast differences, and nobody's gonna tell you that you're ripping off Breath of the Wild because Knuckles has been doing this since the 90s. Tell me you don't want that game. They're so obsessed with figuring out how to make Sonic go faster when really they can use Knuckles as a chance to slow down and explore some different strengths. Combat exploration all of this is ready to go with this radical red echidna that's what made him so exciting to finally play in sonic and knuckles and building around that bolstered that particular game to becoming one of the greatest platformers ever made there's so much left to do with this character in 2d and in 3d he's one of the most iconic characters in the franchise and i know i'm not the only fan who knows he's got a story worth telling and a game worth playing Knock knock, Knuckle Warriors. Sega, use your f***ing characters. Welcome to the next level of November Chaotix. This is Chaotix Plus, where we have spent all of November, and then some, going over everything Knuckles Chaotix. And we did it, Knuckle Warriors. We have finally covered all of the characters of Chaotix. I know some of you wanted me to cover Ray or Julie Sue and all these other characters, and they'll get their time to shine, just not in this marathon, guys. I'm only one person. You gotta give me room to breathe. What is happening? <clears throat> okay. Believe it or not, we actually have one more character to cover. Or, um, a remnant of a character, anyway. This is what the fanbase has dubbed the Wechnia. Or Wechnia? Apparently this is a combination of the words white and echidna, and I don't actually know how you're supposed to pronounce it. I'm sure either way I've done it is, is the wrong way to do it. I can't even say echidna correctly. I keep putting an N in there for some reason. Enkidna. Why, why do I do that? I should do that with a lot of words. I think I just rushed through the pronunciation as a kid, and it just sounded a certain way in my head and just stuck with me. I mean, I don't have any excuse with Mephilus. Like, we hear them call him Mephilus in the game, and I still kept calling him Mephiles in the shadow video. I don't know, I, I'm fine with either way. I think Mephiles might just sound a little bit cooler. Why'd I go with the hard E? Maybe because of Mr. Mistopheles from Cats. Have I ever even seen Cats? That looks awful. Oh, I definitely mispronounce dinosaurs all the time. I still have a hard time saying Ankylosaurus instead of how I want to say it in my head, Ankylosaurus. It just sounds more natural to me. I have no idea why. Oh, and there was this one super embarrassing time a friend actually called me out on in my adult life. We were at a supermarket and I was looking at a rotisserie chicken and I was like, oh man, I could eat a whole roastery chicken. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm an idiot. It all comes back to Sonic. I grew up saying Hydrocity. I know Hydrocity makes more sense, but that just looks like Hydrocity. Every other Ocity word in the English language would lead me to expect that this is Hydrocity. Oh God, who am I to tell you how it works? I literally just confessed to saying the word Rostery as the thing I did in my adult life. I completely forgot what we were talking about. What's the point of this video? Yeah, um, there's a glitchy Knuckles. It's just some leftover data. Uh, it's got the color palette of Mighty and, uh, the flight ability of Tails. And, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, that's about it. Just a neat little bit of trivia that you can uncover all on your own. But since it's in the Sonic franchise and it's a little tiny something, it of course ballooned out into something else entirely in the fan base. I think what makes this one specifically interesting is how easy it is to access. You are just one code away from unlocking the stage select. From there, you go down to pick your characters, and this is the same code where you can play through the whole game as Mighty and Bomb. Also, shout out to the commenter who pointed out that you can actually play through the whole game as Mighty and Bomb. I just got stuck at a part, so I'm really excited to go back to the game and properly play through it with those two characters. Man, I keep going off track. I'm barely into this video. So, yeah, the Wech... Wechnia is here in this character select. Just the name's censored out because it's not supposed to be anybody. Now, in the retail release of Chaotix, this doesn't really do anything outside of Crash Your Game, and it wouldn't be until the internet was more prominent we would get a beta build that showed us that this was indeed Tails at one point. And this creepy glitch is properly playable there. And yeah, it's kind of interesting, and the fan base certainly has latched onto this thing. But strangely, there's not any, like, creepy pasta or anything. you think this would be a prime candidate for it, but I just- I can't find it. And that's probably because there's 
not much we don't know about it. We know Chaotix started off as Sonic Crackers, and it's obvious the dev team used Sonic and Tails as placeholder characters, and I would assume, since they were building a Sonic or Sonic-related game, that Tails and Sonic stuck around in the title for quite a while. There are some unused sprites of the characters still in the data of Chaotix, but as little as there is, it's generally assumed that this was just for an end screen animation or something like that, and maybe that's all it was ever meant to be. Or maybe they were going to be unlockable characters, or maybe they removed Sonic at the last minute in some weird attempt at brand integrity, since we are well aware that Chaotix wasn't quite coming together. Considering stories that have been told about Yuji Naka and that whole Sonic Extreme mess, that wouldn't surprise me. Sonic Team was still a well-respected developer back in the day. Then again, Chaotix still had Sonic Association. Even if this wasn't made by the main core Sonic Team, it was still technically made by Sonic Team, if that makes sense. This was still associated with the Sonic brand and their brand as a developer. And the game reviewed fairly okay back in the day. So I'm not exactly sure if they removed Sonic and Tails just for brand integrity or not. I mean, it kind of makes sense, but if that was the case, I don't know why they even made the game at all. It is still Sega's decision whether or not they want Sonic on the 32X. It's just as likely they ran out of time to properly implement Tails as it is that they ran out of time to properly scrub him from the data. Whatever the reasoning is, whatever the intention, it's probably along one of those lines. Game development has never been a walk in the park. Remnant data is all over the place in games. This one was just fascinating because it's not hard to access. Can you imagine stumbling across this as a kid? I, I mean a kid in the 90s. You probably didn't have internet to back this up and even if you did, good luck finding anybody talking about this. This is just a strange ugly knuckles that breaks your game. But like I said, this little glitch sparked the imaginations of the community. And even if this color palette is a complete mess, this is now his own character within the fan base, with fan art, mods, and all the other darkness that comes with Sonic fandom. But it doesn't stop there, because even people working for the Sonic franchise have gotten in on the action. As I was researching this particular video, I learned that there might even be a Wachnia Easter egg in Sonic Mania. But if nothing else, there are definitely mods that allow you to play this ugly Knuckles in Sonic Mania. But it goes much deeper than that, because it's very possible that this glitch served as inspiration for a character in each iteration of the Western Sonic comic series. Now, some of this is likely coincidence, but even if that's the case, this all circles back around and merges together in a very interesting way, so bear with me. Let's start with Europe's Sonic the Comic. Now, as most of you probably know, these were split between a bunch of mini-stories. Sonic usually got five pages per chapter per issue, and when Knuckles became more prominent, he would get his own set of stories, one of which revolved around a white echidna named Dr. Zachary. Now, you could come to the conclusion that this white fur was inspired by the Chaotix glitch, but the creator said that they went with this particular color because he's an old echidna, so that makes sense. Also gotta love his little five o'clock shadow. Do echidnas need to shave? Would the bottom half of their face be completely covered in fur otherwise? I mean, Uncle Chuck exists with his mustache, and I never once thought about facial hair on their muzzles before, so what? I don't... I need to stay on point with this video. Let's just quickly roll through Zachary's two stories, because they're not long, and this is all we have of the character, but he's still pretty interesting. In his first story, Knuckles happens upon the guy when he sees a strange, but familiar robot sifting through some rubble. Knuckles tussles with it for a minute, and then stumbles upon Zack Attack, who says the the robot is after him. So they make their escape, and when things calm down, Knuckles shows Zack the Chaos Chamber where the Emeralds reside. But unfortunately, it turns out the robot is actually ancient Echidna tech, and actually in the control of Zachary. It was all a ruse, as he knew Knuckles would be so excited to finally meet another member of his species, and in turn, would let his guard down. Poor gullible Knuckles. He's not an idiot, he's just always getting tricked because he's just trying to make a connection. Well, the bad times keep coming, as this robot, but, but breaks the Master Emerald. How powerful can this stupid thing be when everybody's breaking it all the time? Yes, this is yet another time where STC actually predates the games, as this happened long before Sonic Adventure. But back to the story, this is all part of Zachary's plan of revenge against Knuckles' lost people. And with his robot, now powered by the Master Emerald, he takes flight, only to be grounded by Knuckles who busts through one of the wings. The island then crashes into a mountain, the two echidnas fight, and Zack falls to his apparent death. 
to finish the battle. And it's all beautifully drawn. I know the art sometimes is a little rough, but it's far more consistent than early Archie. And the coloring, it's not even comparable. I'm pretty sure this is honest to goodness watercolors. Maybe I'm wrong there, I don't know, but this looks like traditional art and it's beautiful. All of this was enough to distract me from some pretty important questions. Like, for instance, who the hell is Dr. Zachary? Where did he come from? Was he just sneaking around Knuckles this entire time on Angel Island? Why does he want revenge on Knuckles' people? What's that whole story? I would love to know what's going on there. We do at least get some closure for the busted gem. So just in case you're curious about the Master Emerald, Knuckles replaces it with the power-infused mech for a few issues before transferring the power of the Master Emerald into a giant gem as if it never left to begin with. Well, that was a good enough introduction to a villain, but I would have been pretty disappointed if this was the last we ever saw of him. And thankfully he would reappear as a cyborg. Robotnik agrees to help mend the guy in return for some information. That information being the fact that the Emerald Hill refugees, the people he's tried to kill before in the Death Egg Saga, actually found new homes on Angel Island. So Robotnik goes up and captures all of them. This story actually ties into some pretty big changes for the characters of STC, but just in terms of Zachary, all he really does here is play lackey to Robotnik until Knuckles busts loose from this machine, which was going to basically matrix up all the inhabitants of Emerald Hill and power this computer. It doesn't matter, he breaks out of it. Knuckles then takes on some more echidna mechs, and the fight is fun enough. It eventually ends when Knuckles fakes an injury to draw in Zacky Poo, only to have Sonic blindside the white echidna out of nowhere. <laughs> Knuckles gets pissed because this was his fight and he was just faking his injury, <laughs> and Sonic just calls BS on him. <laughs> I love their stupid, obnoxious rivalry. I'm glad to see it made it over in Europe as well. Sonic is such a dick. I don't blame Knuckles in the slightest run and punch this dude in the face. <laughs> well, thankfully, Sonic didn't just roll up and take the win completely. Zachary does try to run off and Knuckles goes in to take his win by just punching the ground and <laughs> opening up the earth below. Just ringed out the dude by removing the ring. That's awesome. We do see that Zachary burrows himself out of the crevice, so he does escape to fight another day, but that's it for the character. There were plans to tell more stories, which would have been great because we still have no idea what this dude's beef was. Unfortunately, it just wasn't to be. A fun enemy for Knuckles that leaves me wanting to know more. I can definitely see some parallels between Zachary and the Wecknia. Again, it could very likely be a coincidence, but stick around because we are not done and Zachary does play into what we are looking at next. About a decade later, Archie would introduce one of the best villains of the Sonic series. And to no surprise of any longtime fan of the Archie series, it's not a Sonic villain. It's a Knuckles villain. This is Dr. Finitivus. And you can tell this is based off the Wecknia because I have absolutely no idea how to properly pronounce this name. Finitivus? Finitivus? Finit... Fini... 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 Fo... Finit... Ugh... Dr. F*** it, Vius. To understand his importance, we would have to basically lay out the entire history of Archie Knuckles to fully understand his impact. So as I love to say in these videos, we will get into greater detail about this character at a different time. As we cover Knuckles' stories in Sonic Speed Reading, we will uncover more about this creepy echidna. But just to give you a basic understanding, Finny is a bit over-designed, but not to the point where he looks out of place in the world of Sonic. And truth be told, I'm actually quite fond of this look. And before I even looked it up, just by taking in an eyeball of this design, I would assume that this was created by Jonathan Gray. And to nobody's surprise, yes, he's the one who designed this villain. And I don't believe we have any confirmation that this was inspired by the Chaotix glitch, but the color scheme is not far off from it. Obviously, you have your white fur, but also the red eyelids, and the sharp angled patterns just make me think of a corrupted sprite model. Also, they have dashes of yellow in there. They they have all the colors of that goofy glitch. This is a dark, evil version of Knuckles. That would be my go-to place the first time I saw that creepy glitch in Chaotix. And also, not just on the design element, but also on the writing element, there's clear parallels between this guy and Dr. Zachary of STC. They are both evil doctors out to make Knuckles' life a living hell. And Finfo Fum does a pretty good job with it. He's one of the Guardian's most prominent enemies. And yes, I said one of. Despite all these echidnas looking like deep, in our OCs, the Knuckles Rogues Gallery is 
quite impressive, and one could argue even better realized than Sonic's. They are, if nothing else, at least comparable. Knuckles' baddies are definitely one of the stronger points when it comes to Archie lore, but it would be hard to compare to the likes of Enerjack. I mean, you just wait till we get to that guy. But Finfin Fin gives him a run for his money, as he has his creepy white tendrils in so many schemes going on behind the scenes. It's all complicated, it's a whole thing. And there are some stories that I really do not want to spoil for you in this video about a glitch. Zachary was easy, he showed up twice and now you know everything you need to know about the guy. But Finn here had some more time to fester into a real problem. While thoroughly explaining him might take a little bit of time, you can sum up his character as a mad manipulative genius that came to be after attempting to siphon energy off of Chaos Knuckles. Again, it's a whole thing. It's a classic comic villain origin. Basically, he was a normal red echidna who was doused in negative chaos energy, which corrupted him and gave him access to some new abilities. And while he loves to scheme from behind the scenes and gaslight his enemies, he's still a very capable fighter, able to manipulate dark chaos energy on a level comparable to Shadow and Knuckles, who is a beast in the Archie book. The dude is fist bumping Knuckles and doesn't even flinch. He also carries around a set of warp rings which he uses to dip in and out of places in a snap, and occasionally even uses them for more combative means. And again, he's done a lot of nasty things to Knuckles, the Chaotix, Angel Island's inhabitants, hell, all of them Mobius. He's right up there with Eggman in terms of threat level. He might not have a machine empire, but he has no problem stepping out from the shadows and throwing down with some of the most powerful heroes of Mobius. He's a good old fashioned supervillain, evil as hell, and absolutely revels in it. I'm absolutely doing him a disservice cutting off the conversation about him here, but trust me when I tell you that it's better to go in understanding the world of Archie Knuckles before talking about the impact of Fin Fan Foom here. I just wanted to put him on your radar. Archie Sonic is, yes, admittedly a mess, but it has some really cool ideas that deserve to be explored, and Finty Minty absolutely makes it worth slogging through the not always well written and convoluted stories that led up to his appearance. And you can tell that the artists and writers had a lot of fun with him. So much so, that I don't think they were quite done with the character once Archie Sonic ended and IDW began, because there is absolutely no way Dr. Starline is not, in some way, the spiritual successor to Finterstein here. They're not the exact same character, mind you. Both of them could exist within the same story and be distinct enough on their own terms. But Starline is much easier to introduce and understand. He has none of the baggage of Archie. You don't need to read a bunch of backstories and really understand the lore and history of the Echidna people. None of that. Starline is the idea of Finitivus refined. And that's the perfect descriptor for the character. He is well-kept, well-spoken, and sophisticated. That, along with Starline's adoration of Eggman, are the major differences between Finny and the Platypus. No creepy black eyes, cloak, and whatever the hell that eye thing is. Actually, I think they kind of reuse that symbol on his design somewhere, don't they? Starline still carries over some traits of the Fininator here, though. They are both brilliant, scheming, manipulative scientists, and both have warping as one of their most iconic techniques. Starline does later replace the warping with other abilities, Abilities, including Hypnosis and the Tricore, a lovely nod to Sonic Heroes that grants Starline access to super speed, strength, and flight. He also has poison in his spurs, which is adorable. So, no, he does not have chaos powers, but I actually prefer that. He's a scientist, and all of his abilities were born from his brilliance. Yes, he does have to rely on equipment for any of these abilities, but they were all created by Starline. He's a super interesting character, and if you haven't read through the Metal Virus Saga or the Bad Guys miniseries, get on that! Dr. Ian Flinativus has clearly had a lot of fun crafting the stories for this platypus. But hold on, Nick, I hear you say. You're getting distracted again. What's this have to do with a stupid glitch from a 1995 video game? Sure, there might be some loose connection with the two white echidnas, but I feel like you're clicking a link too far away from the main wiki article. Well, calm it down, my baby birds. Daddy's gonna feed you. You see, this is where things get interesting. This is where it all circles back. Because up until about, like, a month ago, I think everybody in the fanbase just assumed that Starline was a spiritual successor to Finitivus. But we did get a little bit more information. I have mentioned this a couple times in recent videos, and I need to stress this again. If you are a fan of Sonic comics and you have not checked out the Bumblecast, you really need to. 
How does this channel have less than a thousand subscribers? This is stupid. Go subscribe. What are you doing? Ian and Kyle talk about more than just Sonic, but a lot of the recent episodes have been focused mainly on Sonic. There's still a lot of fun to listen to, and Ian does write more than just Sonic, so if you like his stuff, you should go check out his other work. I'm sure he loves Sonic, but would greatly appreciate you checking out anything else he does. He's got talent. Surely you can branch out a little bit. Maybe... Maybe I'm just projecting here. Anyway, it's thanks to this podcast that we have a lovely little bow to tie onto the end of this video. Because it was in one of these Q&As, Flynn told us that this glitchy white echidna actually helped inspire the character of Starline. The white fur, obviously, but actually the entire color palette is put to use. And instead of it being a sloppy mess, it's actually in an elegant design for an elegant character. How'd you guys make a sexy platypus? The real animal somehow took something as silly as a duck's bill and made it look even more ridiculous. And actually, that species choice, the platypus, that's not by accident either. The game's manuals might have misspoken when they mislabeled the mammal as a marsupial and a mole, but echidnas are neither. They are actually monotremes, a type of mammal that lays eggs. And there are only two types of mammals that exist in the world that do this, the aforementioned echidna and the platypus. So that was interesting as well. And finally, the glitch also helped name the character. Keep in mind, the Wechnia, Wechnia, whatever you want to call it, that's a fan name. In the game proper, the character is represented with a line of stars. That is, man, I would have never once guessed that without having that spelled out to me. This is really cool. Also, I didn't even write this down, I'm just now thinking about it. With that tricore that does give Starline flight, like Tails, and strength, like Mighty, who are also, in tiny ways, mishmashed in the white Wechnia. I don't know if that part was intentional, but that's still kind of cool. All three of these comic villains are a lot of fun, stand out in their own way, and are all connected in some way. And there's enough evidence to suggest that we would not have these three, at least in the states they exist, without some leftover data from Knuckles Chaotix. Maybe they would have existed in another form. Maybe Dr. Zachary would have happened either way. Maybe they weren't even aware of this glitch when they were writing and drawing that comic. Who can say? We still need to give credit to the comic writers and artists who helped flesh out these baddies into engaging villains that challenged our heroes and compelled us to turn pages to see what would happen. I'm sure in a world without the Wetch, we would still have something worthwhile in its place. Regardless, it just goes to show you that, yes, it is easy to poke fun at deviant art OCs, or fans getting obnoxiously fixated on silly little details that developers never gave much thought to, but it's these weird, goofy details that still inspire creativity. That's just a step on a kid's journey into becoming a more talented and creative adult. We've had some incredible stories and talent blossom from fan projects. And either way, we have official comic books with some incredible detailed villains with compelling stories that have you coming back each issue. And yeah, in turn, they are also inspiring kids to be more creative with their own characters and their own stories. And isn't it just so cool that all of that could have started with one silly glitch? I think so at least. Toot toot, Wechnia warriors. Or Wechnia. Welcome back to Chaotix Plus, the next level of November Chaotix. And thank you to Alexander for coming up with this fun little bit of wordplay that I now get to greet you with. Merry Chaotix, miss! Now, so far, I have gone over all the characters and then some when it comes to Knuckles Chaotix. And yes, I do still have to cover the game itself, and I apologize for the delay on that, but that's turning out to be a hefty video. But there was always a topic I've wanted to cover ever since I came up with the idea for this marathon. Something that's kind of stuck in the back of my mind since I originally played Knuckles Chaotix. I got this game with the understanding that this was about Knuckles the Echidna, the guardian of the Master Emerald. But but if you've played the game, then you know there are zero emeralds to be found. What you have instead are rings. Now, those are nothing new to the world of Sonic, or even Knuckles, but Chaotix is just obsessed with the things. You of course have your standard rings to collect, all while holding a ring that tethers you to a partner character with their own ring, and this forms the central mechanic of the game, the tether. You also have giant rings hidden within levels, but there are also giant rings at the end of levels that lead you to more rings. <laughs> 
even the shields of this game look like rings. And Robotnik has swapped out little critters that usually power his badniks with, you guessed it, rings. And not just the little guys, I'm also talking about the boss encounters and even Metal Sonic Kai. Rings, 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 all the way down. Said that word so much already, it's stopped making any kind of sense. So yeah, I was a little confused as a kid, and I was hoping that the story in the instruction manual would at least shed some light, but that just brought up even more questions. You see, in the American manual, the story of the Chaotix takes place before the grand opening of Carnival Island, and Dr. Robotnik is gunning for this island's power emerald, which provides electricity for all the rides of the facility. Knuckles, as the guardian of Carnival Island, patrols its perimeters to make sure the opening goes off without a hitch. But while patrolling a far off section of the island, Robotnik swoops in and captures all of his friends with the combi confiner. Knuckles learns that he can free one friend at a time with a magical ring tether, and from there they set off to save Carnival Island. Alright. So this was still in the days when Sonic storytelling was a little loosey-goosey, especially when localized. But even just one game removed from Sonic 3 and Knuckles, little baby Nerdnik found some giant glaring inconsistencies. What the hell is a Power Emerald? Is that different from the Master Emerald? Super Emeralds? Chaos Emeralds? This just sounds like a stupid battery. That aside, what is Knuckles even doing here? He's patrolling Carnival Island? He's the guardian of Angel Island and the Master Emerald. Not some carny security guard who takes his job way too seriously and doesn't even do it properly. Everything goes to pot the moment he takes his eyes off the place. Also, apparently this isolated loner has all these friends we're just now being made aware of? Clearly, Sega of America was not super concerned about the story. It wasn't a major deal back then, and you can argue this isn't a major deal right now. They just had to fill up a page in the manual, and it's not like anything in the game itself really contradicts these paragraphs outside of the lack of a power emerald. <laughs> As again, that never shows up in the game proper. And I do actually like the justification for the ring tether here. This actually would explain why Knuckles would even bother working together with the Chaotix, and not all at once, because the effects of the combi catcher can only be reversed by the magical effects of the sling rings. And while it makes absolutely no sense why Knuckles would leave one island to protect the theme park on a different island, this at least makes sense to the resort-style settings of Chaotix. And if you smudge the details just a little bit, the Archie adaptation of the story, as much fun as I had making fun of all the goofy elements of that thing, do make the setting a little more feasible. In that canon, this is an amusement park that was built on Angel Island that Knuckles didn't agree to, but since this version of the Floating Island has a little more involvement with the goings-on with Mobius, and Knuckles is not the only sentient animal on the island, it's not really up to him if this place is built or not. Best he can do is just make sure that nothing sinister is going down. This also retroactively makes sense of Carnival Night Zone, if if you're following the logic of Archie. But that's as far as I'm willing to go in terms of compliments for the American rendition of the chaotic story. While there are little elements that I actually like and would have loved to see further expanded upon, the original Japanese story sounds much more engaging, and on top of that, brings up some very interesting ideas. The Master Emerald might not be present in this game, but as it turns out, everything that happens in Chaotix is a direct result of the giant gem. In the original Japanese story, this is indeed a separate island from Knuckles' home turf, but this is not called Carnival Island. In fact, it's not called anything. This is a brand spanking new landmass, and that's all thanks to the Death Egg pinning Angel Island down for a good majority of the Sonic 3 adventure. The Emerald's powers affected the planet once it hit the ocean, giving rise to a new island. And they also established that each member of the Chaotix arrive here on their own accord for their own reasons. Knuckles specifically arrives because he is concerned that this new island has some connection with his floating island. So he goes to investigate, and he only stumbles upon Espio and the others when he has to rescue them. Those interactions alone are stories I would love to see fleshed out. And the island does get a name eventually when Eggman arrives. The Neutrogic High Zone. That is a word that was created by someone who does not completely understand the English language. <laughs> I keep wanting to call it Neutronic. That sounds way cooler. Anyway, yeah, Eggman arrives for his own purposes. He goes to inspect the place and comes across a giant special ring with engravings not dissimilar from the ancient writings of Knuckles' people. So he builds Neutrogic to take full advantage of this new source of power. They don't really explain why he turns it into a resort, but that's also just kind of been his motif, so... 
whatever. What's interesting is I take this to mean that the Master Emerald activated these ancient rings in some way, and within the special zones created by those rings, the residual energy of the Master Emerald and its altar form into the Chaos Rings. I am relying on translations here, so if I am misinterpreting anything, I do apologize. Anywhere I look online, they describe the Chaos Rings forming from Master Emerald Pillar energy, and I would assume the pillars would be the altar on which the Emerald resides. At first, just from reading about the Chaos Rings in the past, I assumed that they had formed as solidified residual Master Emerald energy that caused the island to rise. But that added wrinkle of Eggman discovering ancient rings like the ones found on Angel Island, which, if you remember, was what Sonic found on a beach that kicked off Sonic 3's story, that leads me to believe it's possible that Angel Island had landed in a spot where Knuckles' people once existed on the planet below, reawakening the power of these long-forgotten rings. Maybe Angel Island stays stationary in the same spot in the sky. Maybe Knuckles' people were just all over the place. And it's possible that some of this was retconned a little bit with Sonic Adventure, or maybe none of this contradicts that story. However we got to this brand new island and Chaos Rings, we at least know for sure that this is the direct result of the Master Emerald. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this might be the only time we learn of a connection between the rings and the emeralds of the Sonic games. But I will get into that connection in just a little bit. I first want to talk about the other set of rings I found super interesting. The Dark Rings. These are, quite simply, artificial rings manufactured by Eggman that he uses to power his robots, including the upgraded Metal Sonic Kai. And I like the idea of emphasizing that normal rings are a natural occurrence and dark rings are a manufactured product. And if you consider that Chaos Rings were originally referred to as Holy Rings at one point during production, I wonder if that particular dynamic was played around with with the story. I mean, later on they would establish positive and negative Chaos energy, and both Sonic X and Sonic Adventure 2 showed off manufactured emeralds that can still react on some level similar to the real deal. They don't really dive any deeper than that, and I know the rings were originally created just to have some sort of differentiation from Mario's coins, but whether they intentionally did this or not, they did create a very interesting world that is worth digging a little deeper into. The rings being a natural phenomenon makes perfect sense to me, as does Sonic's speed. I don't really need a creator myth to expand upon them. This is a world filled with loops and chaotic energy, and it only makes sense that rings would form to help contain this power and take on the shape of a world that's filled with landscapes that are naturally filled with rings. And Sonic being a creature that evolved to adapt to this environment also makes sense to me. But beyond that, Eggman trying to break down, understand, and harm this power makes him a very interesting threat, and I like that this particular idea is still a continuation of Sonic 3 in some way. All that time with the Emerald, all that time with those rings, he has finally created rings of his own, and can power up an already deadly robot in ways we haven't seen before. Metal Sonic transforms into a Death Egg robot after Eggman infuses the power of a ring into him. I just think that Dark Rings are neat and an idea worth exploring, but so are the other major loops in Chaotix, the Chaos Ring. Because it makes me wonder, are all rings born from emeralds? Or is it just these chaos rings? I would assume that they are born exclusively from master emerald energy as they take on multiple colors and don't act too dissimilarly from chaos emeralds. We do know that standard rings have some kind of a connection with emeralds already, thanks to acting as a power source for super forms as well as functioning as a doorway into dimensions where you can collect the emeralds. I don't know, it's all super cool and it makes me think about all the other connections to all these other power sources. Like I've said already, the way I've always seen it, the emeralds and the rings are a natural occurrence in the world of Sonic. And we also know that people of ancient tribes have worshipped these emeralds. There may or may not be an actual spiritual element to it. With all the crazy demigods, I would assume that's the case. But I just don't think the story needs to end there. We have actually spent a great deal of time in the games detailing a bit of the history of Knuckles' people and their relation to the Master Emerald. But even with what we know about their destruction, and we do know that Chaos and his babysitter reside within the Master Emerald, we don't really have a proper answer as to why the island is sitting in the sky. We just know, for sure, that the Master Emerald keeps it afloat. Now, Sonic Adventure did establish that without Chaos present within the gem, that will apparently throw things off too. But even with that element involved, all of this makes me feel like there is still a lot of compelling stories worth diving into when it comes to the Sonic game universe. What is the true purpose of Angel Island? Is the Master Emerald just too powerful to sit on the planet below? Clearly, it has a reaction to it. And... With all the sets of emeralds, I've always found it strange that the Master Emerald, despite its name, is the only one of its set. 
which is weird when you consider that Angel Island isn't the only floating landmass in the skies above Sonic's world. What about Little Planet, Babylon Garden, Lost Hex? What mysteries still hide in the clouds? What stories and adventures await? I would certainly love to find out. And all those thoughts just came from the Master Emerald's influence on Knuckles' Chaotix. I just think it's incredibly neat that there is so much potential from all these little throwaway ideas that were brought in just for this game. Even if some stories contradict each other, with a little hard work and creativity, I still think you can merge some of these elements together. And Sonic Team certainly isn't afraid of a retcon here and there. And I do still like some of the smaller elements that were brought in from the American side of things, like the explanation of the ring tether. I think you could easily roll that into a grander tale that's inspired from the Japanese side of things. And if done right, if Sonic Team ever wanted to get back into bigger stories and wanted to be a little more bold with detailing the actual world of Sonic the Hedgehog, well, we certainly have a lot of ideas worth looking into. But maybe let's, uh, let's first start with an actual name for the planet. Hello there, I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good and bad games. And we had a pretty good run, didn't we? For a show called Game Apologists, I haven't had to do a whole lot of apologizing for the Sonic series up to this point. I mean, it got a little dicey with Sonic CD, but all in all, the classic Sonic games are classic. I've spent an exhausting amount of time explaining just that, going so far as to say that Sonic 3 and Knuckles is one of the greatest games ever made. I've seen that game compared to Super Mario World, Mega Man X, Donkey Kong Country, and whether or not you like that game over these other ones, it's not important to me. What is important is that it was compared to the very best of the Super Nintendo library, because that's how revered the Sonic franchise was back in the day. That was the general opinion of most gamers. But Sega went in a decidedly different direction with their next game, Knuckles Chaotix. This was a spin-off title for a spin-off system, using the popular Sonic rival as well as a collection of unique characters to experiment on just about every front, everything from the core mechanics all the way down to how you select your character and level. There really isn't another experience quite like this game, be it in the Sonic franchise or in gaming in general. And because of that, it does have its fans, but also its detractors. There's a reason why you don't see this game on the exhausting amount of Sonic game collections in the years that followed. But to even talk about this game, we first need to briefly go over the system it was made for. We all know the story by now, but it bears repeating, lest we allow history to repeat itself. This is the 32X, a little Sega Genesis that sits on top of your actual Sega Genesis. It's basically an add-on that allows you to play 32-bit cartridges on your core system. You can still play regular Sega Genesis games, but it doesn't really change the experience. And the games made exclusively for the 32X can not be played any other way. You need this add-on to play that library. Sega decided to release this horrible tumor of an add-on and release it two months prior to their brand new Sega Saturn, which was already running into 299 problems prior to launch. But just to be completely fair, Nintendo was not above releasing this kind of stupid crap as well. Remember, this was in the same time as the Virtual Boy. And before that, they did release the disk drive for the Famicom, and later would do the same for the Nintendo 64, and neither of those were overwhelming success stories. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Granted, Sega went a little overboard with the Sega CD, and would later redesign both that add-on and the Genesis itself, and then would go on and pack it all together into one one little sexy machine that nobody ever heard of. But my point is that while we make fun of all that nowadays, if Sega had just released upgraded models of the Genesis that included 32X tech or the CD add-on, I mean, it really wouldn't be that much different from the PS4 Pro or the Xbox One X. That's the iPhone business model. And PCs have been outdating their own tech the moment it goes up for sale for decades now. How's everyone enjoying their 3DSs with an extra thumbstick attachment? Oh, and don't forget your Amiibo NFC accessory. Also, you need Amiibos. Nope, those are different from the Skylanders. You have to buy all those separately to get everything out of that game. Oh, wait, did you buy Xenoblade Chronicles? Well, you gotta throw all this crap out, man. That only works on the new 3DS. I, well... Never mind, I guess history was going to repeat itself anyway. But you see my point here? Sega's bonehead decisions really aren't that different from other game companies with the capital to extend the life of their expensive hardware. It's just more apparent when it looks like you're building a snowman out of Sega consoles. Someone had to make these mistakes if anyone was going to learn from them or improve upon the idea. Of course, you could also point out that the Sega CD wasn't exactly an overwhelming success, so maybe don't do that again. But they went ahead and did that again. And 
and I would say much less successfully. Because at least the Sega CD had some truly stellar titles that made the purchase worthwhile. You had Lunar, Popful Mail, Snatcher, and of course, Sonic CD. The 32X, on the other hand, had the worst version of Doom, the worst Spider-Man game, and a bird shmup. That was actually a selling point for me as a kid. I thought this game looked super rad. And that's not to say there aren't good games on the 32X, but the libraries are not comparable, not even remotely close. But the 32X did at least have a Sonic CD equivalent. And Chaotix came out after CD. It came out after Sonic 3 & Knuckles, but it's not quite the follow-up one would hope for. And many would argue it's not even as good as the messy Sonic CD. And I should give you Sonic Warriors a little warning. With this game going forward in the Sonic series, specifically, you're gonna be seeing a lot of them on Game Apologists, and not my spin-off show, Unapologetic. That series is set aside for games I feel are truly masterpieces, games everybody should play, and I don't feel that way from most of the Sonic series. That's not to say I don't love the hell out of games that are gonna be coming up, some of them are some of my favorite games of all time, but I'm also not gonna pretend there aren't some glaring issues. And don't get me wrong, the adventure games are gonna get their fair shake, I love to explore why people adore the those games as much as they do. And in those specific cases, I can at least cut those two games a little slack since they were jumping into a brave new third dimension. But Knuckles Chaotix is a 2D Sonic style game released after the series had mastered mechanics and clearly defined itself in a bloated genre. Even with all the pretenders, there was no mistaking a Sonic game. But Chaotix took a decidedly different direction and probably wasn't the best choice. I was not aware of it at the time, but this would be one of the first of many speed bumps stumbling down the peak that was Sonic 3. Alright guys, we know what a Sonic game is, we know how to make them real damn good, and we have this hot new Echidna character that allows you to experience these levels in whole new ways. Should be a real easy win to spit out another set of levels to placate fans and convince them to throw down for a 32X, that should be a nice, cheap, and easy solution while we work on the Sega Saturn. We have everything we need to hit this out of the park. Yeah, but even with all of this at our disposal, I can't help but feel like Knuckles is missing something. Ah! Perfect! In hindsight, it might seem like another traditional Sonic would have been the right call. And for many young fans like myself, I would have been perfectly fine with that. But that's not what the market demanded. We were ready to jump into a brand new experience. Sonic 3 and Sonic & Knuckles did not sell as well as Sonic 2. People were growing tired of the formula. And with all these new gaming experiences just on the horizon, if Sega was going to jump back into 2D Sonic, they had better bring something new to the table. And, uh... Boy, oh boy, did they bring something new. Probably too much. Before we tackle anything else, we need to talk about this ridiculous ring tether, because this stupid thing binds itself to all the good ideas this game has and drags everything down with it. In a game series all about speed and momentum-based platforming, the geniuses at Sega decided that you need to constantly drag around a second Animal Man through your entire adventure. Aw, uh, Nick, you big dum-dum, this isn't a Sonic title, you say. And yes, you could argue that this is not a Sonic game, Game, therefore I shouldn't treat it like a Sonic game. But here's the problem. It's not a Knuckles game either. I still remember the first time I started playing this game. Finally, I'm gonna have a fun adventure with my favorite character to play from the Sonic series, and immediately I knew something was very, very wrong. Knuckles was slow and sluggish. The 32X is supposed to power up my Genesis, right? If you were, like me, an idiot kid in the 90s wanting a 32X, then you more than likely wanted it to play Knuckles Chaotix. And you were also probably very familiar with S3K, so you know Knuckles' moveset going into this game. But everything he does feels off. And then on top of that, you slap a giant lizard on me. Great. This is Espio, one of the new playable characters of the game. And outside of him, you have Mighty the Armadillo, Charmy B, and Vector the Crocodile joining the Echidna on this adventure. You'll have a chance to choose one of them after the opening tutorial, and I highly urge that you do. Trust me, everything feels a little bit better once you break free of Sluggles. And they all have their own secondary abilities, and a grand majority of them get you up the side of a wall much faster than Pinky can. Also, I just need to say it, when Knuckles is gliding around with a ball flying all over the place, it kind of looks like he's going commando for all the island to see his magical meaty clackers. Ah, 
Oh, Nick! You interrupt again? You dumb bitch! It's not a Knuckles game either! His name doesn't even appear in the title in Japan! Oh gosh, you're right, Captain Hindsight. That was really stupid of me as a kid in the 90s to expect a Knuckles game from a game called Knuckles Chaotix. I should have definitely known all those other things going into this. Look, I was excited to play these brand new characters, but I was not happy with them doing my boy dirty here. And if they had built a game around these brand new characters and their abilities, I would have been fine with that. But that's not what we got. Yeah, it's not a Sonic game. And okay, fine, it's not a Knuckles game, but it's also not an SBO game. It's not a Vector game. It's not a Mighty game. It's not a Charmy game. It doesn't even belong to the damn bomb. This game belongs exclusively to the Ring Tether, and they don't even utilize that mechanic properly. To be fair, this game does what no Sonic game had done up to this point, and provides you a tutorial area, both in the opening isolated island level, and a proper tutorial after that. Feels a little redundant, but fine, sure. This will let you grow accustomed to mechanics like anchoring your partner, building up tension, and slingshotting the pair of you across the level or up to a higher platform. And the slingshot is here probably to replace the spin dash, and don't get me wrong, that is still present, but it's massively gimped. Problem here is that it takes much more time to set up a slingshot. It'd be much more convenient to just zip up the side of a wall, but, well, the game doesn't want you to do that. And take care of what button you're hitting. In old Sonic games, any of the three buttons on a Genesis controller act as your jump button, and in turn will act as the secondary skill of whatever else you're doing. Here in Chaotix, the only button that jumps is the C button. The middle B button will anchor your partner character, and the A button will call them back to your location at the cost of 10 rings. But what if you don't have 10 rings? Does it just not work? <laughs> No way! What kind of capitalist society do you think you live in? You go into the red! Yeah, your ring count can go backwards! Is this Knuckles Chaotix or a Sega business simulator? That joke would be way more funny if that game didn't kind of already exist. Sega's a weird company, man. As a child, you might be wondering how it's possible to give away something you don't have. But little did we realize this game was just preparing us for the misery of adulthood. And actually, this is something I've never come across personally, but while scouring through the instruction manual, I did did come across an interesting tidbit I was never aware of. If you go 100 rings into debt and cross the goal in a level, the game will restart. Yikes. So I guess that could actually make for an interesting little bit of challenge if you wanted it. You have to collect at least 100 rings before you can cross the finish line. That'd be kind of cool. I j uh. Just looking at this control scheme and playing around with the physics, it boggles my mind why they thought any of this was a good idea. If you came into this accustomed to pressing the A button to jump, that's just where your thumb landed, well, too bad, buddy, because that's going to cost you here. Ugh, I mean, they have an entire button dedicated to realigning your duo, which tells me that this setup has the capability of getting you stuck. And if you do get stuck, the game is telling you that it's your fault and you're going to be punished for it. You want to know why people have a problem with this rubber band nonsense? Just head over to a spring, the super common thing that shows up in every other 2D classic Sonic game. Just hop on it and... Yeah, I don't know how any developer hopped onto a spring, looked at this, and thought, yeah, this is a good idea. I'm not even sure if there's any point in explaining the secondary powers of these other characters. There's nothing in these levels built around those abilities. I mean, sure, they're more vertical in design, so climbing up the side of a wall can be very helpful, but it more feels like they shoved everything out of the way just to make use of this stupid ring tether. And before we even get into the levels themselves, choosing one of them, hell, choosing one of your characters, is also a game of skill and luck. Yeah, your character selection is a claw grabbing game, and you have a chance to grab one of these two garbage robots that can either slow you down, like with Heavy, or cause splash damage if they are damaged, like with Bomb. So that's also super fun. The levels are no longer in a linear layout like they are with every other Sonic game. They are instead chosen with this goofy bumper here. You only have five zones, but don't you fret, you now have five acts in each and every one of them. Oh god. Man, all of them drag along and they're all bare bones because, again, these are designed to compensate for the random stupidity you can get into when you clap two Sonic characters together and chain shot them across the screen. And being randomized, you can either find yourself in a different zone every time, or more than likely, in Botanic Base four times in a row. Either way, as Retroopolis Zone pointed out in his video, boss battles are usually clumped into the back half of your playthrough. And trust me, uh, they are not worth the buildup. This polygon 
final effect was, uh, I'm sure this was real neat for a minute, but I mean, this lasts for a literal minute. Can we, um, can we, uh, start the fight, please? What is happening here? I mean, I like the new cutscenes before every boss fight, but why on earth did they skimp out on the animation for the one fight I would have loved to seen that in? The Metal Sonic fight is not great. It's inventive enough. You have to hit the bumper like you would for the levels, but this time it's going to land on a number, which will dictate what attack Metal Sonic uses against you. And when you time it right, it will land on the X, which will damage him. And this can go a couple of different ways, depending on how well you time it. It could be like my first few times where it felt like this fight would never end, or it could be a little bit more like my most recent battle against this robot where I just hit it four times in a row and it was over. <laughs> oh well, at least I got some kind of encounter with Metal Sonic prior to the big Titan transformation. Man, at least that transformation does look dope. I do like his angry fanged face. It looks way better than another crappy final boss battle with Metal Sonic that skipped the cool base form and jumped straight into some junkyard art installation. <sighs> Not today, Nick one problem at a time. And like I said, the levels themselves are far more vertical in design. They're usually wide, sprawling, and somewhat labyrinthian. And some of those descriptors would work in a game designed around Knuckles, or even one of these other characters. But that's not what you get here. Don't get me wrong, climbing and air dashing certainly helps out. You could not make it through one of these levels in a solo Sonic experience, but considering how varied the character abilities are, and the fact that you sometimes just have a bomb strapped to you, they can't design anything as tightly as they did with Knuckles' little areas in S3K. Also, what the hell's with the transportation spots in these levels? Those used to be super quick little spurts of speed that got you right back into the game. Here, you have to wait on... Uh nothing, and then lazily get moved into a different room? Or just like, lower down into the same room? What was the point of all that? This level is called Speed Slider. Mm-hmm. There's this one spot that you get a drill car, and all it does is show this automated segment that slowly drives you through an empty room and then drill through, like, four walls. What is the point of that? People whine about needless gimmicks in Sonic 3, but at least you get to interact with the damn things. I don't even get to control this damn car! What they could have done instead is split up this car into, like, four different pieces and drop them in different spots on the level, giving your characters some incentive to explore these sprawling maps. But that's not what you get here. The closest the game really gets to that concept is having to track down a button that starts a clock in every act of Amazing Arena. And sure, it lights up the room, but that's literally it. it doesn't activate doors or springs or any fun platforming puzzles, nothing like that. You can actually get to the end of the level without ever activating that dumb clock, and the game just tells you to go back and get it. It's super annoying. In Sonic 3, we had rings to special stages hidden around all these giant maps. And even if you explored a spot that didn't have a giant ring, you at least got a monitor or something for your efforts. And Chaotix does have giant rings hidden around the stages, but they're not for special stages. They're for bonus stages. And I apologize, I promise there's a difference. Bonus stages don't lead you to Chaos Emeralds, or in Chaotix's case, play school stackable rings. Bonus stages just get you nice little extras, like more rings or more points, or the ability to manually choose your character and level, which many would say would probably be a standard thing you could do in most other video games. That and it drains your ring count, so more often than not, it's just not worth your time. Again though, you do still have special stage rings, but they once again adopt Sonic 1's ability to jump into it, that being grab 50 rings, head to the end of the level, and jump into the ring at the goalpost. So yeah, these maps make zero sense. You clear any hazards out of the way so you can compensate for all the goofy nonsense that comes with these stupid tethered abilities, and you remove any reason to properly explore these levels, which is extra frustrating when you think back to that opening isolated island tutorial area. What happened to that? You had to anchor your partner on one button while you made your way to another one? Or use them to levitate a platform and drag you up the side of it? I mean, there are a couple of kind of similar gimmicks throughout the levels, but I'm seriously racking my brain here. I don't think we see these particular puzzles ever again, which is kind of lame. They could have really expanded upon these ideas, really make you think these things through. But I don't really think there are any proper platforms forming puzzles that require teamwork. Also, before I forget, there are item monitors here, but if you were expecting more creative elemental shields, you'd be out of luck. The original shield is back, 
as is invincibility, which, weird gripe, but the animation feels like a downgrade from Sonic 3. And of course you have your 10 ring box, but that's all that returns. You do get some new ones, like character boxes who turn you into, well, whoever's on the screen at the time. And that is a nice little way to add variety. And in hindsight, these could have been implemented a little better if these levels had specific challenges set aside for specific characters, a la Mario 64 DS. And you also have the swap monitor, which, well, just swaps the two characters on the screen for a little while. But you also have monitors that allow you to grow and shrink. But once again, they're not really utilized. This would have been interesting if there were some environmental obstacles for you to overcome, but that's not the case here. The big sprite turns you into a bruiser for a little while, and the small sprite just is kind of a pain in the ass. You're just gonna end up sitting around waiting for that to wear off. The growing and shrinking monitors really are only here to show off some graphical effects of the 32X. The blue ring box is about the only useful new monitor here, which clumps all of your collected rings into one larger ring, giving you the chance to hold on to everything you've grabbed up to that point if you happen to get hit. You couple that with the shield, it's like a secondary bonus hit. This game is... Uh, it's just a glorified tech demo for the 32X. We have a cool set of physics thanks to the tether, even if it doesn't work super well in a Sonic game, and we have some graphical gimmicks that had been done already by Nintendo with some Super FX chips, so this was already outdated by 1995, and these goofy little graphical upgrades would have been just fine for a standard Sonic game. And yeah, maybe that would have been a safe choice. Maybe it would have been a tired choice, but it would have at least been another solid win under Sega's belt. Instead, we got a game full of weird ideas that are not properly thought through, and sacrifice a lot of standardized design in an attempt to make this tether work. And when you have to compromise as much as this game does, well, most other developers that were at Sega's level would have known when to call it quits. But Sega's gonna be Sega. And if I'm honest with myself, that's what had me intrigued. We know about Sonic Crackers, the proof of concept of this game. Hell, we honestly have a great deal of information of the behind the scenes production of this title. And maybe it's because of this extra knowledge, it gives me the impression that they went above and beyond with their determination to make the ring tether work. Despite all the changes from Sonic Crackers to the final design, this stuck around and they built an entire game around it. Maybe not to the best it could have been and maybe just to show off the stupid tricks of the 32X, but there there was something about this that they believed in. And I think, even as a kid, I could see hints of brilliance shine through. I know this is technically not a good game. I'm not about to tell you that this is a solid experience that everybody needs to play. But at the same time, I find it challenging to flat out call it bad as well. There's still something alluring about this title. Something that always keeps it in the back of my mind. Something that makes me look back on it quite fondly. And I know I'm not the only one. So, while I have spent a great deal of time detailing the negatives of this game, I'm now going to spend even more time telling you why I love all of it. I never started this channel with the intention of picking apart the classic trilogy. Truth be told, that's been done to death and arguably a lot better by other people. Best I could hope to do was potentially provide some kind of unique insight and unique jokes and just be as passionate as possible. But it's called Game Apologist for a reason, and Chaotix is a game I am much more interested in picking apart and trying to understand. What is it about this game that makes people, myself included, overlook some very obvious flaws and still have a good time? How do I describe such a specific and surreal experience? Well, a hefty chunk of that is probably because of nostalgia. And I mean proper nostalgia. Like, this came from a different time of my life, and I only really remember the good and fuzzies it made me feel. I never had a whole lot of experience with this game to grow sick and tired of it. So Chaotix, for a long time, felt like a dream. One of those dreams that makes sense while you're experiencing it, but once you wake up, immediately everything feels absurd. And while it was just so vivid moments ago, for some reason, I can't quite recall what I experienced. But even if the details are fuzzy, I still remember the emotions I experienced. And that's what this game was for me. A weird dream that I could not quite remember, but still enjoyed. Or maybe this is just what hallucinogens look like. So yes, absence does make the heart grow fonder. And I certainly had Sega Stockholm Syndrome. I wanted the 32X to play one single game, and I really only had that one game. I also think I had crappy Doom, but that game scared the hell out of me, and and I'm not proud of that. But my point is, and I'm sure many of you can relate as well, I was excited for this game for specific weird reasons, and I was determined to love it. So I gave it more time than I probably should. So yes, I'm gonna sound biased, and I'm gonna sound nostalgic, but I don't always think that's a bad thing. 
I think if you properly understand why something isn't the best it can be and still love it anyway, that's a perspective worth looking into. And I won't always be able to be as personally invested with a game like I am with this one. But for now, I am. And hopefully, through this perspective, I can properly detail to you why I love this game so much. Here's the thing about all the complaints I spent an exhausting amount of time detailing to you. The biggest sin this game actually makes is just that it's kind of boring if you play it too long. Out of all of those problems, none of them were born from frustration. I was never worried about busted controls or cheap depths. It's a finished game, it's not a glitchy mess, and it didn't instill blood boiling rage like some of the later 3D games would go on to do. But this game still has that strange experimental messy magic of some of the 3D titles. I knew the flaws even back then, but for some reason I still found myself thinking about this game after I put it down, wanting to give it another shot. And I know a massive part of that is personal preference. I have spoken with people who have found this game very frustrating, but it's definitely an easier laid-back experience for a Sonic game, and I don't always think that's a bad thing. And I notice that about my personal gaming preferences. Sometimes it's okay to just dick around, and that's what I use this game for. Sometimes all I need is a couple of levels of swinging around a couple of colorful cartoon characters to some catchy tracks, and I'm good. And sometimes that's just how you play games as a little kid. People still remember Sonic 1 fairly fondly just because of Green Hill Zone. And I know the fan base nowadays is sick and tired of it, and yes, the rest of the game isn't quite as good as that first level, but back in the 90s, sometimes all you had was a demo booth and that one first level, and that was all you needed. You weren't super concerned with zipping across the level as quickly as possible. It was just fun to control Sonic and jump around all these hills and find some satisfaction in exploring all these nooks and crannies. And yeah, it's not exactly straightforward in terms of design, but it was still fun to explore, even if there wasn't much of a reward getting there. And I think as a kid, I treated the entire game of Knuckles Chaotix like that. It also makes me think of Mario Sunshine. Both games have a heavy focus on a brand new mechanic that's strapped onto something familiar, and both games keep a pretty consistent theme. Now that I think about it, both of them kind of have a tropical vacation vibe. And for some people, they're going to be annoyed with the lack of variety in the levels or be frustrated at being forced to deal with a silly new gimmick when you wanted something more familiar. But for others, if you're enjoying the music, the characters, the visuals, it's not going to be much of a setback for you. And maybe you've had your fill of traditional Sonic, or in Sunshine's case, Mario. Yeah, you have fun with Sonic, but why not mix that chocolate with the peanut butter and see what you get? And no, you don't always get Reese's, but it's still fun to experiment. I mean, we still love those silly Sonic mods for a reason, right? As deceptively simple as Sonic can be, and how natural those games flow once you get the hang of them, you still have to take the time and learn how the game rolls. And while it can and should be a fun process, I am aware that that can be somewhat taxing to other players. And it's been a very long time since I was a kid, so I'm sure the classic Sonic games gave me way more trouble than I'm remembering. But with a little patience, with a little practice, the game feels so utterly rewarding just by simply moving around. And I think that's kind of the same thing for the Ring Tether. That's not to say you need to force yourself to get good at a bad mechanic, but I would argue that it's incredibly rewarding once you know what you're doing. And the more I played around with it, the more I saw why the developers were so determined to make it work. Pulling off a proper slingshot is satisfying. Chucking your partner up onto a platform above you, having them anchor you while you build up tension and shoot upwards, that's awesome. And that's not something you can do with a standard spin dash. And that is not to say that they couldn't have built levels a little bit better to take advantage of situations like this, but if you tackle those levels with that mindset, I think you're going to have a pretty good time. Speaking of, I know I already pointed out that they had to compromise a lot in level design to make the ring mechanic work, and yes, it could have been better. I honestly don't mind having fewer badniks and zero pitfalls. And honestly, the lack of badniks isn't for the entire game. That's for a lot of levels, sure, but I did notice quite a few of them on the back half of the axe, so I don't know if it was just for specific levels or if they were just adding more challenges as you got deeper into specific attractions. I think it's a little bit of both. Either way, the lack of a life system does cut down on the challenge. And I wonder if they try to compensate that with the lack of checkpoints. I don't know. This game's so easy, I didn't even notice the lack of them until I started thinking about it just now. The levels can be a little dull and confusing at points, but if you're wanting to just run around, the stages are far from offensive. And while I don't believe the giant special stage rings are implemented the best way possible, I 
feel like a lot of people agree that the special stages themselves are some of the best in terms of classic Sonic. Here, you must guide Lemmingwings through the maze of the small intestine and solve the riddle of the Katata fish. Like previous special stages, this was a chance for the developers to show off some technically impressive 3D gameplay. Man, they just get better and better every time. I can't wait for Sonic to go full 3D. Clearly, Sega knows what they're doing. And yeah, I know they look a bit dated now, but this looked really cool in the 90s. And I still think they're a lot of fun today. Seriously, if you had told me that they had started this project with the special stages in mind, and the rest of the game was just secondary, I probably believe you. Because it feels like a lot more thought was put into these layouts compared to the game proper. I rolled my eyes at Infinite Blue Spheres. I mean, yeah, they were fun, but it took me a long time to master them. I wasn't really feeling like jumping into another set of them after I collected the Super Emeralds. But with Chaotix, I would have taken a full game set up like this. You don't get a half pipe, you get a full pipe. At least at first. You do have some platforming challenges, narrow walkways, bump pitfalls, hazards, and this was all pretty impressive stuff. Not new for 1995, but new for the Sonic series. I did have a ring out that felt cheap here and there, but I do feel like they did a fine job bumping up the difficulty from level to level as I followed my nose to each and every new Fruit Loop. But at times, they might be a little bit too forgiving. Honestly, outside of Genesis 3D Blast, this might be the easiest set of special stages. They do offer a bit of challenge, but they also allow you to swing back around through the track if you miss some blue spheres. Granted, you have to be sure you have enough rings to do that, as they will count down as a timer. So that is a good excuse to build up some rings before you jump into the special stage ring. Because outside of that 50 ring entry fee, whatever you bring in with you is your starting point for a counter. So yes, the special stages I think are a lot of fun, but they don't give you any real incentive to grab all of them. I mean, you do get a cameo from Sonic and Tails, which is great. Also, how was nobody talking about Naked Leg Sonic? This is the good ending? You couldn't even color him correctly? Dude couldn't even be bothered to put on pants for this event. I guess Knuckles wasn't the only one going commando. You do get the cooler ending if you don't get all of them, and um... Well, never mind the low stakes. Yikes. And they don't unlock any super forms, which, yeah, I get it, but it's still kind of a bummer. There's not much a traditional super form can really do in these stages. Again, this game's pretty easy. Still would have been nice if it allowed your character to freely move around without the partner, or I don't know. I'm sure that would have required a hell of a lot of programming for just a silly bonus. These levels are designed with a climbing partner in mind, after all. And speaking of those partners, they are both a weak and strong point for this game, depending on how you look at it. Like I've said before, if they were so hell-bent on getting this ring tether to work, I kind of feel like they should have provided us with characters that didn't have as many abilities as the Sonic cast seems to have, forcing them to rely on the sling ring and also maybe get a chance to design better levels around that, as opposed to just taking a Sonic level and clearing the path for you to putz around with a couple of shackled speed demons. But that was just one idea in an attempt to elevate the tether and, well, heavy and bomb. But that's not to say you can't have some fun with the rest of the cast. There are enough vertical spaces to shoot Espio up the side of a wall, and I never got tired of seeing him run around on the ceiling, as needless as it ended up being. And Mighty, just being a Sonic clone, feels nice and zippy. The wall jump might not be the neatest trick in the world, but it pairs well with Mighty's speed, allowing you to practically ricochet off a wall and keep your momentum going. And I can tell you how versatile Vector ended up being, thanks to his wall climb and directional jump. I didn't realize it at the time, but Triple Jazz's Sonic Freedom Alpha features a similar mechanic Mechanic, and while I do love it there, I also appreciate how zippy vectors can be. So yeah, I meant no disrespect, Triple Jazz. I hope we can still be friends. Oh no, dude, it's it's totally okay. I just make games. You have all the hard work complaining about them. And Charmy, good God, this little dude just free flies all over the place. Without the ring tether, it practically breaks the game, but that doesn't make it any less fun. It kind of makes me wish they could have implemented something like this for Super Sonic. That would have been super rad. Now all these characters feel fine enough even with a tether on them, but that is still the greatest drawback, because all these characters would probably feel a lot better on their own. And despite all of my playthroughs, there's nothing here that shows these abilities working in tandem with each other. And even if you do figure something out, it doesn't feel intentional on the game's part, more just skilled players figuring out some neat ways to combine everything. Then again, that forced cooperation wasn't exactly my favorite thing in Sonic Advance 3 or Sonic 4 Episode 2, but even in those cases, I personally feel like the failures fall on the developers, not the idea itself. 
And even saying that, trying to imagine developing scenarios that accounted for all the potential team-ups and abilities, I'm starting to understand why this game did not come together. Because all these great ideas branch out into a plethora of other great ideas. And while there is some extra attention to the sling ring, they still didn't really focus on one core set of mechanics here. And it ends up being a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. All of these characters still feel great, and honestly, I'm glad they exist and still exist. But the more I think about it, the more I'd like to see them strike out in solo gameplay. Hell, I'd even take more focus on the sling ring and see its full potential. There had to be more to this gimmick. They clearly had a lot of great and dynamic ideas for the Sonic formula, so why were they so hell-bent on this stupid tether? Well, the answer is obvious, but it's not one I see a lot of people talk about. Something I found surprising when researching Sonic 2 was that apparently, the game was designed with two players in mind. After all of these years, I tend to forget how much emphasis they put on Tails' inclusion in that game. Because when I play it now, I don't think of multiplayer. I was thinking about the streamlined single-player Sonic experience. There's nothing in these levels that screams two-player to me. You don't even need Tails on screen. Hell, the special stages are objectively easier without him. I'm sorry, Gilly, I know I just cameoed on your Sonic 2 video, but Tails makes the special stages objectively harder simply by upping the ring count. I don't care if he only loses the rings he collects. What difference does that make if it's still up to me to pick up his slack? I'm still the one that has to collect all those extra rings, and the bomb smacks are still super distracting anyway. Ah, uh, well, it's honestly not that big of a deal, and the game does give you the option to play Sonic or Tails solo, so it's really a non-issue. So I hope we can still be friends, Gilly. Get out. Get out of here. Go home. You're dead to me. Uh, get out. Get out right now. It's the end of you and me. Ultimately, whoever was Sonic was getting the meat of the experience. Chaotix, after all that time, was still trying to solve the multiplayer problem. And building it around a system that forced two players to work together was certainly an inspired thought. So just to test how well this works when you bond two characters with rings together, I decided to bring in someone who was bonded to me by a ring. Uh, it's me. I'm not Nick. Uh, so yeah, I sat down and played with Nick. Yes. And I'm not a Sonic player, so it was a very interesting experience for me. Uh, no, but at first I found it really counterproductive. Being lassoed to another character just felt like you were yanking each other around in every direction except the one you wanted to go in. Especially when you had Heavy, or one of us had Heavy. I, yeah, I had Heavy yeah. completely accidentally, and he can't jump more than two inches off the ground, and there's nothing I could do, so you just had to pick me up and like carry me yep. through segments, which was awesome. <laughs> um, I had the most time playing Charmy, and that was fun just because I was dicking around and not going anywhere except to the ceiling. <laughs> that is a good point, though. Like, I didn't think about that through this entire rambling nonsense I've been doing. There are kind of different levels of experience that these different characters provide. Absolutely. I mean, that's pretty standard for any, well, any well made game where you've got, <laughs> you know, multiple characters selections. They yeah. shouldn't be identical choices that are just aesthetically different. It should always be, you know, skill set and specialty based. And that's still the case here. You know, right. Charmy's got his flight and I can just bumble along wherever I feel like it. I love it, you bumble. Um, <laughs> and SBO, I played with SBO, which was good because he can do the wall climbing, which isn't as fun as flying, but it's a close second. It's fun, right? It's useless, but super fun. Or once I got the hang of it, it was fun. I had a lot of fun when like, you're like just running across the ceiling and I'm just bouncing along the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yo-yo effect for sure. <laughs> but I didn't understand what you were talking about with this being, you know, a two-player thing in relation to the other Sonic games, because I've always seen you play them, but obviously it's always been solo. Right. And um, Sonic 2, as soon as you turned that on, I realized, like, what the problem was. Yeah. Because I've always seen you just zip through all of these levels as fast as humanly possible. Like, so mm -hmm. fast that because I'm not a Sonic player, I'm like, where, the, where are we? 
Yeah. <laughs> but as player two, like, that's still the case. And in half a second, I'm off screen if I don't know which direction we're going in or what's happening. Or if I go too far, it's like if I go forward ahead of you, mm -hmm. again, I can't see the next thing to fall off of. So now I've fallen off a cliff and I can't see because there's no split screen. Right. You know, so I feel like that was an effort that they made to put a second <laughs> sure player was. in there. It was uh, not a good effort. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I knew what I was doing, I don't think it would have been very feasible for me to keep up with you. For that reason alone, as soon as we, we started playing, I realized what the point of Knuckles Chaos was. Yeah. You know, um, for better or for worse, you're completely tethered to the person that you're playing with. Um, and you can't just, like, ditch them <laughs> yeah. at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> on another hand, I didn't see a lot of point to it other than keeping you two on the same screen and yeah. connected. Like, there didn't feel like there was a whole lot of teamwork really necessary. Necessary. It was, hey, can you both not stop each other from getting to the finish line? Yeah, no, we <laughs> spent more time just trying to figure out how to survive a level than we did anything else. There wasn't any puzzles laid out for us to sort out. Well, and it wasn't even survival level. That would have been something, you know, you have to teamwork your way through some enemies, but there really weren't a lot of enemies in the no. levels that we played in Chaotix. Um, even when I was playing Charmy and we went through all of mm -hmm. the levels. So, no, like they're just, it was, can you make it to the finish line? And that was kind of it. Yeah, no, I think our greatest challenge while we were playing at those couple of sessions was when I was heavy was just trying to get up the side of a freaking <laughs> ramp like this basic sonic thing oh, yeah. and our greatest challenge was like how do we get up the side of this damn thing I ended up picking up a robot and just hoping for the best <laughs> well we kind of did that with SBO2 though oh yeah no we um, did that with everybody you know because you would just automatically spin dash to the little loop-de-loop -loop, and mm -hmm. I'd be over here like wait what and of course <laughs> because we're connected it's just yo-yo effect suddenly you're back yeah. with me on the floor all right I'm leaving now all right thank you wifey <laughs> Warrior, two, two. Bye. No, okay. okay. <laughs>Well, that was fun. And as she pointed out, there were a lot of problems even when you had multiplayer involved. But from my perspective, I have to admit, I did have a lot of fun. The experience is so much more enjoyable when you have a real life partner joining in. And sure, you could say that with just about anything, but if a game's designed around a multiplayer experience, I think it's important to experience the multiplayer. Nobody is tails in this setup. And yes, again, it still can be messy if you're both trying to go in different directions. It's kind of like that scene from Wild Wild West. Anyone remember that move? Okay. But when you work in tandem, it brings a whole new life to the game. Like to the point where I really need to stress that this is how you should play Chaotix. It's the difference between an arena shooter with real people versus one filled with bots. You still get the core idea and can have a lot of fun on your own, but the human element makes all the difference. And I know this is not a one-for-one -one comparison, but it's only here did I really feel like I truly understood what they were going for with this game. Yeah, a lot of it's still silly gimmicks, but this feels like the ultimate goal they were going for. But you still can't discount all the nonsense that is still involved, even with multiplayer. You have to wade through a lot of crap just to get to this point. Even getting the second player set up is an absolute chore. You need to beat the tutorial level first and by yourself. I have no idea why they didn't want a second player involved with this. I feel like this would be imperative. Hell, second player mode should have had its own unique tutorial. But yeah, you don't get that here. You have to play that single player mode and isolated island. After that, you have to exit the game properly. I don't really remember. I had to read through Isolated Island like three times before I figured out how to get that stupid option onto the screen, which doesn't make any sense to me because I know on some beta builds, they had a second player option right there on the title screen. I have no idea why they removed it. They still give you the option for tutorial, even though you're forced to go through it anyway. I, I don't know. And ultimately, as much as me and my wife talked about it already, she did also mention how much better it felt when you were playing one of these characters by themselves. They were rare moments, but it was truly liberating. The ring mechanic works well and can lead to some great fun, but no matter how much more development they slapped into this, I don't really think there's any change in the fact that a pure single player Sonic gameplay experience is just better. That doesn't mean they didn't have a fun idea in their hands here. But I'm not about to tell you that Chaotix is secretly a must-play masterpiece when you bring in somebody else for the ride. No matter how you play it, the game still needed work. But if you are going to play it, I highly recommend you get a second controller and see what kind of fun you can get when you bring in somebody else. My wife doesn't play Sonic games, but out of all the other classic games, despite the flaws, I think Chaotix might have done it the best.
I think I've said just about everything I can say about Chaotix. I've rambled on for quite a long time, but even when it's all said and done, I still don't feel like I've properly conveyed how I feel about this game. Let me try and put it to you this way. If Christian Whitehead showed up at my door and told me I had to choose between Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Knuckles Chaotix to get a mobile port, I would probably choose Knuckles Chaotix. Even knowing it's the lesser of the two games, even knowing Sonic 3K is my favorite game of all time, even knowing S3K deserves it way more than Chaotix, even knowing it's the bad choice, that's the selfish choice I would make. Because as much as I love 3K, I've had plenty of opportunities to play the game. And again, I know that's not the same for everybody else. Not everybody had a DS or an Xbox, GameCube, <laughs> Genesis, Saturn. And I get that. Again, this is a selfish choice. But Chaotix didn't get those chances. It showed up on the 32X, which out of personal experience, even back then I can tell you was a piece of finicky trash. And on a defunct gaming service called GameTap. And yes, I did sign up for GameTap just to play Chaotix back in the day, and that was the only game I played on that service, and I have no regrets. But GameTap doesn't exist anymore, and you really should not be buying a 32X just to play Chaotix. It's a weird little game that I could really only recommend to hardcore Sonic fans that are interested in the history of the franchise. Like I said, no matter how much development they put into something like this, if they made a solo release of this game on mobile and charge money for it, reviewers are going to tear this thing apart and honestly, rightfully so. Even with widescreen support, even with online multiplayer, even with a smoother set of special stages, even with these lovely flourishes that made this the best version of Chaotix, it still has all those other flaws we talked about. A game like this could really only exist in a collection like Sonic Gems, when that's packed in with other weird obscure Sonic titles so you can experience this history and also feel like you got your money's worth. And yes, as much as I love the Gems collection, the lack of Chaotix is absolutely a mark against that disc. Because personally, I feel like they missed the boat when it comes to re-releasing Chaotix. Bringing it out again in a solo experience is a stupid idea. Regardless, as I just said, I would happily support it. And if I was given control of that kind of insane decision, I would make the bad decision. Because here's the thing about Knuckles Chaotix. If you have only experienced this game through the opinions of YouTubers, you can't really enjoy all of that music while we are rambling away like lunatics. These characters, these animations, this aesthetic, this music, it all comes together into an experience not quite like anything else you'll ever see. Yeah, it's a little messy here and there, but that doesn't mean you can't have fun. And I can't properly describe to you how inviting everything felt when Dorn to Summer started playing for the first time, or how blown away I was when I saw that big red metal Sonic. It might just remain a weird dream of my childhood, and I'd be okay with that, because I really don't need a whole lot of reviewers picking apart this game saying, I don't see what the big deal is, I don't know why anybody likes it. Like, ugh, just, you don't get it, man. And it's not like a knock against Cybershell's video, either. He is super familiar with Knuckles chaotic like to a level like I can't even compare to I learned a lot just from watching his video so even when he's tearing into that game and the lost potential of a knuckles spin-off series I understand it's coming from a sonic fan who knows what he's talking about so even if we don't have the same experience with the game I had a great time listening to him so yeah obviously meant no disrespect cyber shell I hope we can still be friends I don't even know who you are this game is so unique that I honestly feel like you should really play it for yourself really sit down with some patience and some time to figure out the sling ring and what your favorite character is to play around with. Because if you've been looking at all this footage, hearing this music, and not really bothered by the idea that this game's a little easier than the other ones, you might find yourself falling in love with this game like I and probably a handful of other people have as well. Because there is still a lot here worth loving. I mean, for crying out loud, I didn't bother getting into a whole lot with the characters in this video because, well, I've spent two months leading up to this point going into all of them. Look how much we had to talk about just from this one goofy game. 
there's a lot to appreciate and explore here. And even if they didn't bring this game back and remastered it or whatever else, you can still tell that there are great ideas that maybe they weren't fleshed out to the best of their ability in Chaotix, and maybe some of them should have been abandoned, but there are other ones that just needed a little push over that finish line. And you see hints of that in little bits and pieces in future Sonic media. I've seen constant comments pointing out how the Chaos Rings look like the World Rings from Sonic and the <laughs> Secret Rings. But let's also not forget Sonic Colors, which also takes place in a theme park. And you know, those laser diamonds look awfully familiar. And of course, we can't forget Sonic Mania. We got the triumphant return of Mighty. They've implemented that blue ring box. There's a lovely reference to the giant red Metal Sonic with Metal Sonic's other transformation. And I seriously doubt Studiopolis would exist without some references from this game. I'm seeing a lot of amazing arena in this design. And maybe the Chaotix cast isn't as full as it could be in modern Sonic terms, but the Detective Agency is still a great set of characters. And comic artists and writers have shown us how much potential we can get just from a silly glitch like the Wecknia. I've seen commenters saying that they saw that as like a ghost of a guardian past who's haunting Knuckles. Like that's a really cool idea. When I was a kid, I think what disappointed me the most about Chaotix was that I had all these extra characters and I expected this to balloon out into a grand Sonic adventure like S3K was. And yeah, in hindsight, knowing why they pushed it out as quickly as they did, I understand that was not a feasible option, but I don't see why that isn't the case nowadays. I mean, whatever with Mania 2, what if we got Chaotix 2? You pick one of these five characters and explore levels actually based around their abilities. Or you know what? Even have that sling ring possible. Maybe you have elements where you have to disconnect for a little bit while you guys solve separate puzzles. I don't know. The possibilities are endless. Whether it be piecemeal to really make these ideas shine, or even bringing back that flawed original game, I would welcome it with open arms. No, it's not my favorite game in the franchise, and on its own, I can't really tell people that they should go out and play it. But if you are the type of person that can sit through a video like this, engage the entire time, and you have never played the game, well then what are you waiting for? This has been November Chaotix. This has been Chaotix Plus. This has been Chaotixmas. This has been the Game Apologist. And despite all the bad, I hope you saw some good in Knuckles Chaotix. Toot toot, Team Chaotix. Toot toot, Team Chaotix.